Mitch Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. You know, and it's a very thank you for you know. I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there. You know, I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland, and I love the Scottish food. It's great food. I said to Melania, you know, haggis. Look at that. What's more than more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. You have to remember back in 2002, 2003, there was a wish by George Bush for regime change. That's what was driving him. Nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, which of course didn't exist in Iraq. So they had to construct some sort of formula, some sort of cover story, in order to persuade the British public that intervention in Iraq was right. Now David Kelly, uh, as an expert in weapons of mass destruction, knew that uh, this was untrue. He knew that there were probably no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was a guy that could have brought down that was a guy that could have brought down the whole system. I reckon you're chaff. You've been thrown up to divert uh, our probing. The Foreign Affairs Select Committee, that um, parliamentarian briefing, I think that was an indignity to him. We saw it on the news, and my very first thought was shock. Um, oh my God, you know, this man is in the eye of the media hurricane. Uh, he should be protected by that at least. Mr. Gross, I know your hands, Prime Minister. Are you going to resign over this? I don't know the details of how Lord Hutton happened to be selected, but what was certainly the case is that he was the right kind of judge to use from the point of view of Dining Street and the intelligence services as well. Of the 21 days of hearing, only one half of one day was spent on discussing the forensic aspects. That is disgusting. We were given the Hutton report the day before it was published, but... Actually, what happened was he went too far. The events of 2003 were disgraceful ones in this country's history, and it's unfinished business. Those responsible for an illegal war, those responsible for the death of David Kelly, have not been brought to justice. There's no, been no inquest into David Kelly's death. There needs to be one. We need to make sure that those who behaved in a reprehensible way in 2003 are finally brought to book. Well, now you know why we're broadcasting from underground. I have no idea why none of you around the world heard what I said in my opening remarks. But not to worry, I'm going to say them again. 
976,000 people watched last Sunday's show. You can count them, something you can't do with other programs, making us indisputably the biggest political show of its kind in the entire English-speaking world. That's really something, and it's thanks to you, and it's thanks to my friends who managed by a shoestring to get this show on the air every week. The numbers who watched last Wednesday show is only a little behind the numbers for last Sunday's. And so it is with some sadness, I say, that we cannot sustain the midweek moats extra. We're going to have to pause that for now until we find a way to fund it, to finance it, because all of this, of course, cannot be done for nothing. Now, as I was saying, before I was rudely interrupted by the sound of silence, uh, the berserk tour of Biden around Europe, uh, dribbling all over the war zones, uh, was uh, something to behold. Distasteful. The gobules were many, and it's difficult to pick uh, one or two of them. But one I will concentrate on. Not since 1945 has the head of one military superpower called for the overthrow of the head of another military superpower. But that's what Joe Biden did in Poland. And in this case, both military superpowers are nuclear armed, and one of them, Russia, is hypersonically nuclear armed. It doesn't get much more dangerous than going towards the border of the other superpower and demanding uh, that their president should be overthrown, should be removed from office, calling for regime change in a country next door that just happens to have just as much nuclear firepower as you do. As a mark of recklessness, it can only be explained in one or two ways. Either, as the White House tried to do after his speech, well, walking it back in the American terminology, it was Joe running off at the mouth. He was verbally drooling and said something that he didn't mean, or at least the American administration doesn't mean. Or, as I prefer to believe, Joe Biden said the quiet part out loud. He stated publicly that which is merely privately held as the war aim of NATO uh, for which read the United States uh, in the confrontation in Ukraine. Because that's what this really is. It's not a Russia-Ukraine war. It's a U.S.-Russia war by proxy using the people in Ukraine and the public infrastructure and the private property in Ukraine as the entirely dispensable pawns in the game. It is an effort to probe and confront Russia as a prelude uh, to its balkanization, its regime change, and the replacement of the current government of Putin uh, with a government more to the United States liking like the one that they had in Boris Yeltsin. To that end, Joe Biden's comment that the Russian people were not his enemy, he was probably telling the truth about that. They don't, of necessity, hate Russian people. They just hate a strong and dignified Russia, able to and willing to stand up for itself in the international arena. They can't bear uh, that a regime they did not pick, indeed, they picked the Yeltsin regime, otherwise I'd be talking to you now with Mr. Zhuganov, Comrade Zhuganov, as I call him, who would have won the, the Russian presidency rather than Yeltsin, but for American interference, imagine that, in a foreign election, namely the Russian presidential election. They loved Russia when Yeltsin was in charge, 
when Russia was lying drunk on the floor in the form of Boris Yeltsin and everyone was picking its pocket. Picking its pocket through, but not exclusively, the very oligarchs who then fled to Western countries with their ill-gotten billions, hundreds of billions in many cases, and who then spent the intervening 20 years giving money to Western political parties and politicians and buying Western media, only to discover that they are now the enemy and their yachts and their assets are being systematically looted by the private property-loving capitalist system in Western countries. My heart bleeds for them, of course. Now, the other thing that needs to be said about Joe Biden's berserk tour is that he promised the 82nd Airborne Division that they would soon be in Ukraine. Despite both the Biden administration and the NATO leadership repeatedly, publicly stating that no NATO forces will be committed to the war in Ukraine. If that were true, how could Biden say that when the 82nd Airborne get to Kiev, they will see for themselves the bravery of the Ukrainian people? Was this, too, something to be walked back? Was this also just Joe Biden drooling, havering, like a senile old man? Was it? Or does it reveal a private truth into the public arena? Now, I don't speak for Russia. I'm not a Russian. Uh, but I would probably quite fancy fighting the 82nd Airborne Division uh, in the streets of Kiev. I think that would go rather badly for the United States Armed Forces because not even a year ago, not even nine months ago, I watched the very same American forces run out of Afghanistan like a thief in the night, driven off by men who rode around on bicycles who wore not military boots, but sandals, who carried not high-tech weaponry, but mere carbines. I saw the Americans running away. So from my point of view, <laughs> if I were the Russians, I'd say, I'll see you in Kiev, 82nd Airborne. But is that what you really want? Because that could very quickly turn into a pan-European war. That could very quickly turn into warfare in Poland, a warfare in Romania, warfare in the Baltic states. That could very quickly turn into warfare deep into the European continent. And if it did turn into that, it could quickly turn into a nuclear war. First on the battlefield, then intermediate, and then in the worst possible case, an intercontinental exchange of ballistic missiles that would end human life on the planet. Is that what you really want? And if it is, or if it isn't, are you content that a man that cannot ensure that his fly is closed after visiting the toilet... Are you sure that a man wandering the corridors of the White House at night, wondering where the toilet is, is really the man to have in charge? Mind you, they don't have that much of a choice. Because after senile Joe comes Kamala Harris. Have you seen Kamala Harris? Well, the Democratic Party voters saw her. They took a good look at her. And fewer than 1% of them gave her their vote in the presidential primary. Even though the Clintons were bigging her up big time, after all, she is exactly one of them. If they were designing a Democratic Party candidate for president, she's what they would have designed. 
But the voters took a look and said, thanks, but no thanks. Since when her polling ratings have fallen even farther and faster than Joe's. Sleepy Joe is now favored by, on the economy, just 33% of American voters. He has an overall approval rate of 40% and a disapproval rate, an active disapproval rate of 55%. At this rate, the Democrats are going to be wiped out in the midterm elections in November. And at this rate, once that newly republicanized Congress gets to work putting Joe Biden on trial, impeaching him over Ukraine, imagine that. Once that republicanized Congress gets to work on Hunter Biden, about whom more later, then the chances of Donald Trump being re-elected as president in 2024 would seem to be a very short odds bet indeed. So what are they going to do? After Joe, it's Kamala. If they dispense with Kamala, do you know who it is? Do you know? It's Nancy Pelosi. Who's better before lunch? I'll grant you. Uh, but after lunch, and even after dinner and lunch, she literally cannot bite her well-manicured fingernails. She could not scoop her expensive ice cream that she showed off to people in her super-duper kitchen in her private residence during the long period of lockdown. That's the chain of command in the United States of America. Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, or Nancy Pelosi. You take your pick. But the real fools, of course, are the Europeans. The Europeans have gone over the cliff behind this imbecile, beside, behind this man who's not in control of his own bodily functions, never mind in control of his marbles. They've all sacrificed the entire European economy. They've all sacrificed millions of their own people to unemployment and penury to please what? Who? Joe Biden? Are you serious? Even Ireland did it. Even though Joe was caught on St. Patrick's Day on camera saying, and I quote, I may be Irish, but I'm not stupid, unquote. They've all gone stark raving mad, including, of course, here in Britain. And we've done it all to try and protect the last gasp of American domination of world affairs, American domination of the world economy, the dollar hegemony about which we'll speak later. They've all done it for the Americans. Puts a new slant on the special relationship, doesn't it? It's a bit like the special relationship that Miss Lewinsky had with President Clinton, where the weaker partner is always on their knees, if you get my meaning. Now I want to turn to Hunter Biden now that I've got down and dirty. If you have not checked out the contents of his laptop, it can only be uh, because your stomach isn't strong enough. Because most people ineluctably would be drawn to a laptop which contained not just examples by the tens of thousands of Hunter Biden's depraved sexual tastes, including a taste of sex with children, but in a way even more important than that. Important, though that is. 
His laptop describes absolutely in detail the criminal nexus which existed between the Biden crime family and the oligarchs and the then government of the Ukraine. They didn't try to hide it very often because they didn't know that Sleepy Joe would be back sleeping in the White House. But now that he is, this information ought to bring down the American regime. Talk about regime change, Mr. Biden. It'll be your regime that's changed long before the regime in Moscow, I'll warrant you. But that's not what I want to talk about in Hunter Biden. Do you remember the bio labs? Do you remember less than four weeks ago when the advancing Russian forces said they had discovered the evidence of a string, it turned out to be 36 bio-warfare labs belonging to the Pentagon, the American Defense Department, in Ukraine. You remember, if you followed this story, that this was immediately denounced as Russian disinformation. And those of us who highlighted it were called Russian stooges. We were all doing it for rubles, even though I've never possessed a ruble and have no need of anybody's rubles. I highlighted this because it seemed to me a matter of potential gravity. But no, it was Russian disinformation until who else but Victoria Newland, the architect of the 2014 coup in Kiev, which overthrew the elected president, the elected government of Ukraine, sent them scurrying for their lives. Victoria Newland, appearing before a Senate committee, was forced to acknowledge that yes, there are bio-warfare labs in Ukraine. And we're worried, she said, about the Russians getting their hands on them. This was later walked back. No, they're not bio-warfare labs, they're just nice, cuddly bio-labs. In which case, why were you worried about the Russians getting their hands on them if they were harmless, nice bio-labs? And if they were harmless, nice bio-labs, why were they being run by the Pentagon and not the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Science? Why was the U.S. military paying for 36 biolabs where? In Ukraine, right next door to Russia. So much, so bad. But it turns out, according to that well-known Bolshevik newspaper, The Daily Mail in England, that actually... These biolabs were funded by Hunter Biden. The pervert Hunter Biden, the son of Joe Biden. At that time, the vice president, now the president of the United States of America. Could this plot get any more thick? Well, yes, it does. The Daily Mail that mouthpiece of the Kremlin, revealed not only that Hunter Biden invested his own money into bio labs in Ukraine, well-known centers of profit. I mean, why buy property? Why invest in oil and gas? Why invest in building hotels? You can invest your own money in a bio lab. Not only did he invest his own money, he persuaded the United States government 
to put hundreds of millions of U.S. taxpayer dollars into these bio labs in Ukraine. What first attracted the United States Treasury to putting its precious resources not into clean water in Flint, Michigan, not into roads and bridges in Alabama or Mississippi, not into the larders and fridges of the American people devastated by economic disaster over these last few years. No, let's put American money into bio labs in Ukraine. If you believe that they did all that through Hunter Biden for humanitarian purposes, I've got a bridge here in London that I could sell you going very, very cheap. I'm a Nigerian prince. Why don't you send me your bank details? If you believe that, you are an idiot. Now, if you follow the money, as we are oftentimes told to do, then follow that money and you'll see the depth and the extent to which the United States government has used and abused the people of the Ukraine to the point where the very existence of their country as an independent state is now in question. Finally, if you saw what I saw on videos online today of Russian prisoners of war being prepared for execution, stripped, blindfolded, their hands tied behind their back and kneeling on the ground, waiting for a shot in the head. If you saw what I saw today, Russian prisoners of war being kneecapped by Ukrainian soldiers who filmed themselves, including their faces, the fools, whilst doing so, if you saw the gypsies all over Ukraine being tied to lampposts, their pants pulled down and left down, being lashed and then left for any passerby to have their perverted way with, then you probably will not need to watch the Netflix documentary that I watched to my cost, to the cost of my psyche over these last three days. Hitler's death squads, the Einstadtsgruppen. If you have got Netflix and you don't watch it, it can only be either because your stomach is not strong enough or you simply don't want to know about the dark Nazi heart that continues to beat in the western part of Ukraine. It's going to be a rock and roll show tonight. I suggest that you fasten your seatbelts right now. George, the deep state, we mentioned it before. So rather than fear-mongering that everything that's going on at the moment with the COVID, the wars, blah, 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 why aren't we all addressing the deep state rather than this fear-mongering that's going over and over again? How do you address it? What I'm trying to get across, and hopefully your listeners will understand this, there is a deep state at work, and you know that. Everybody what? knows that. That's a you, statement you, of the bleeding you, obvious. Oh, so let's do something about that. 
Rather than rushing and rolling what? about the school. Give us a lead. Be our leader. Be, be, be our leader, Dell. Who are the deep states? Yeah. Oh, what a brilliant question. Uh, those, those are all over us. Uh, what should we do about them? We should uh, make them accountable. <laughs> I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to work out whether you're in the territory of shape shifting lizards. Or you're talking oh, about please, MI5 please. and MI6. Please, don't turn into a circus, George. You know full well what's going on. And please don't I do, I do, I do. I'm just struggling to get from you what it is we should be doing about them. What should I do about MI5 and MI6? And how should I do it? Just stand up and go... There's something really wrong here. And There's something up. really wrong here. There you are. I've there sorted it. Go. I've sorted it, Dell. Thanks for the call. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. It's so clever, these jingles. Now, look, here's tonight's poll. Has Joe Biden lost his mind over Putin regime change? A, yes, B, no. It's up to you. You can vote on my Twitter feed, Blue Tick, George Galloway, on my YouTube channel. And if you go to my YouTube channel, please, please subscribe to it. Or on my Telegram channel. That's t.me forward slash George Galloway. Now, uh, the numbers to call because we'll have more calls tonight. We've got two lines. We've got two members of my family working those lines and very good at it they are too. So we'll get more callers tonight even than last week. If you're in the United Kingdom, the number is 080819655522 and it won't cost you a penny to do so. 0808196552. If you're in the United States or Canada, it's also toll free, it will cost you nothing at all to ring plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And you can email the show anytime at onair at moats dot TV. Now, on Wednesday, for those who were watching, we had a most eloquent and articulate and very serious call uh, from a professor in the United States. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time, and I expressed the wish uh, that we might be able to talk to him again. No sooner had I expressed that wish than the clever people who helped me here managed to get him. He is... Professor George Callas, Professor of Political Science and History at Miramar College in the United States. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. A lovely study I see behind you. Excellent, good taste. Um, uh, let's uh, start in a way where we left off uh, when we spoke midweek. Um, here in Britain... If not the general public, though most of the general public have, but the entire political class, the entire uh, political apparatus, the entire media, uh, all the organs of the state, the football authorities, everybody uh, has gone Ukraine crazy. No one can quite explain why. When you ask them, have you ever worn uh, the colors of Yemen in solidarity with the millions who have been killed there? by British and American weapons, by our closest ally in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, or any other of the conflicts that we've lived through uh, this last uh, 22 years or so. Uh, no one can quite explain what it is that's special about Ukrainians. Is it the same, first of all, in the United States? Down on the street, I mean. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to your show, and I uh, am happy to be with you and all your viewing listeners and audience. Um, the subject of our discussion is U.S. propaganda and domestic, and I should add, foreign policy. Uh, this is an old story. 
uh, I think it's interesting what's happening in the UK is being echoed back and forth over the pond here. And basically, we're both being, essentially, we're being drowned in a sea of lies and hypocrisy today. And, of course, I want to echo back to our original interview meeting in my discussion here, because uh, what we have on our plate here is a long story, a, a very uh, sad story of U.S. national security state propaganda operations, ideological operations. It goes way back in history. What's happening in Ukraine is not new. So what I propose to do with our, our brief interview tonight is try to give a summary uh, based on the the topic of, of U.S. propaganda and its impact, not only on the domestic population, but also in the U.K., Europe, and globally. Because don't forget, U.S., National security uh, propaganda operations are a global system. It's not just here. But anyway, let, let me add something else. There's nothing new in this history of propaganda operations. And essentially, we have an ideological stranglehold uh, on the American public opinion with regard to domestic and foreign policy, which is the focus of this discussion. Now, let me begin also. Uh, Putin made a statement. Putin was absolutely right to call out the U.S. and Western propaganda mainstream media as an empire of lies. Uh, that's on the historical record, and which we'll briefly go through. But I'm going to go one better than Putin. I actually call it empire of propaganda. And uh, let me explain what I'm trying to say here in summary. The uh, U.S. National Security State War of Aggression, if you will, and there are many of them in history. Uh, the first casualty, of course, is the truth. Of course, being very cynical elites, the truth is to be manipulated. And I want to explain basically some of the techniques and components of how this system works. Uh, so, for example, the United States National Security State System and its associated corporate mainstream media uh, are using propaganda to hide the long historical record. Now, the historical record is key to breaking through the propaganda fog, if you will. And that's the, the point, is to censor it or to fragment it. Or as I tell my students, I say, look over here, don't look over here. Look over here, don't look over here. It's a sleight of hand trick. And, and it's a very old story. So there's a long historical record of U.S. overt and covert aggression in order to make this current crisis look like uh, the other guy is at fault instead of the real culprit, which is the U.S. national security state system and its NATO allies, which in fact, as I see it, is the originating aggressor regime that provoked Russia's special operation intervention response, which I characterize as really a true humanitarian intervention, which I will explain and back up my claim a little bit later on. So what I claim is that this is a U.S.-NATO-Ukraine crisis, which goes as far back as the U.S.-NATO-backed uh, Euromaidan coup d'etat in 2014, along with the ensuing mass onslaught and slaughter against the Ukrainians and Ukrainian Russians. Don't forget, there are Ukrainians involved in this also, not just Russian speakers. Uh, and and the, the, the essentially war on terror from the uh, regime, of course, with the help of their, their neo-Nazi battalion allies, against the people of Donbass for the last eight long, bloody years. Now, well, here's what's important. This has been censored from the Western media. And that's the, the critical point we're trying to make here. So, so what we are seeing here are the key elements with regard to how effective U.S. propaganda and uh, domestic and foreign policy in the context of this current U.S. NATO uh, crisis, how, how it works. Well, there are key propaganda operation outcomes to this in the current crisis. And again, it's, they, it's off the shelf. They've used it over and over again. We've just shifted from one region of the world, uh, Southeast Asia, Latin America. Now we're uh, Middle East. Now we're in Europe again. Okay. Again, meaning what also happened with the, the U.S. bombing of Yugoslavia. 
So the control of the message is key. So control of the message is how we control the, all the issues surrounding the current crisis that is presented to the American people in order to gain a sympathetic consensus and support for U.S. foreign policy that is connected to domestic policy uh, via kind of a complex of institutions. For example, the military industrial uh, intelligence, academic policymaking, think tank complexes supported by uh, the corporate mainstream media, which essentially is, is, the, is the broadcast medium, the bullhorn, if you will. Now, what is U.S. domestic policy and how is it related or correlated with U.S. foreign and national security policies? Well, the classic answer is simple. To keep Americans uninformed through disinformation while also garnering their uninformed support for another U.S.-made foreign crisis. And I know that sounds kind of contradictory, and that's the whole point. It is an internal contradiction, because the theory is, well, you inform the public, they can make considered decisions, but in fact, using disinformation, you literally systematically uninform, or if you want to call it de-inform them of what's happening. So this is essentially a distraction propaganda maneuver to blame Russia for the ongoing domestic policy problem. So let's take, for example, what's happening here in the United States. Uh, so as we know from recent uh, news reports, uh, Biden's ratings are gradually tanking and because he has failed to actively and effectively support comprehensive uh, domestic policies, for example, like uh, national public health system or free public education system, basically starting from the community college, which... Uh, essentially, he blocked for funding, uh, failed to cancel the massive uh, national student debt, which is skyrocketed into the trillions of dollars, and also failed to effectively tackle the ongoing inflation, which predates the, in, uh, the invasion. In fact, the inflation is systemically, historically connected to uh, the 2008 uh, great capitalist financial crash, which we're still suffering them. Okay, so this has part and parcel of accumulating over time uh, the problems of uh, domestic policy in the United States. Now, how does that connect uh, with foreign policy? Well, of course, we have midterm elections coming up uh, on the horizon. And in the context of this, we have following ratings. So, again, look over here. Don't look over here. So, yeah, that, but Professor, that, that's uh, in a way the most interesting thing because that doesn't seem to be working. There he is, uh, prancing around, uh, if he can prance, uh, on the European stage, playing the world leader, uh, galvanizing people for the possibility of uh, hot war beyond the borders of Ukraine. But his numbers are still falling. How do you account for that? Well, I think the idea is that now we have global information, alternative forms of information, which I want to also include in my analysis here, where people are saying that we don't buy it anymore. He, his rates are falling because it's a crisis of legitimacy, which actually has been kind of ongoing for a long time uh, within the, uh, the political institutions here. Uh, people are becoming critically aware that kind of the gig is up. They're understanding how the mass media, corporate mass media works. And now we have the, the, the social media giants, of course, which all kind of interconnect and collaborate. Uh, so what I think what the president is doing is this look over here, over here strategy is not working because people are doing this. They're taking all this information and, of course, they're bringing it together and starting to say, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Why is Ukraine right now uh, on the top of the list of issues? So back to propaganda. How does it work? You have to manipulate uh, as much as possible. And I feel that the propaganda mileage are getting out of this is going to fail. It's not going to last. Very, very interesting. Long. Look, we're going to have to leave it there, Professor Kalas. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. I hope you'll do so 
again, uh, but uh, the time marches on, especially now we've put the clocks forward. Has Joe Biden lost his mind over Putin regime change? A, yes, 88%. B, no, 12%. That's on Twitter. On YouTube, it's yes, 93%. Hard luck, Joe. No, 7%. And on Telegram, <laughs> it's yes, 97%. No, 3%. What can I say, Joe? The people have seen through you. Now, here's my general knowledge question. On this day, in 1952, the musical comedy Singing in the Rain was released. The male star was Gene Kelly. Who was the female lead? I bet you don't get it. A, Ginger Rogers. B, Sid Charisse. C, Debbie Reynolds. Answer after this short break. Let's play a game and I'll ask you yes or no questions. Ready? Okay then. Sick and tired of hearing the same old voices on the wireless? Are you looking for an alternative opinion to the mainstream media? Do you have a thing for a Scottish accent? If your answer is no to one or more of these questions, then you need the mother of all talk shows, Miss George Galloway. Listen, watch, and share the fastest growing political program in the world! It's blue, sir. Where's the cheese pizza, Robinson? Come on, what are the public paying you for? Oh, and uh, get another virgin clod away. There, there's a good chap. Oh, who's ringing the old uh, burner phone? Hello? How did you get this number, Ghislaine? No, 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 that's impossible. I, I can't possibly fly to New York. Why? Uh... Our mummy's grounded me, oh, yes. Certain to cut off my allowance, you know. Y yes, yes, I, I know it comes from the public, but uh, she holds the strings. Oh, I've uh, got to go. Uh, my, my pizza will be here uh, any minute. I'm not sweating, you're sweating. Ghislaine, don't call again. Robinson? So, come here with that moist towelette. It's getting a bit hot for my liking. Here? Yeah? Where am I? Welcome to St. Peter's Gate, my son. Is this one of that Hillary's tricks, that devil? Be still, my son. The Clintons cannot hurt you here. You are safe with me in her. Oh, heck. Knew I shouldn't have taken Bob's homemade vaccine. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I am not worthy. Before you pass on, you may ask any question you desire. Anything? With my omniscient knowledge, I can tell you anything you wish to know. Well, Lord, you got to tell me. All powerful creator of this universe, before you judge me, I've been searching for answers my whole life. Yes, my child. I have to know. Who shot JFK? Ah, ah, another one. It was a lone gunman by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald. He was not a government agent, and there was no second shooter on that grassy knoll in Dallas. My God! This goes higher up the window! You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, the answer is Debbie Reynolds. Were you like me and say it was Ginger Rogers? 
I would have actually put money on it being Ginger Rogers. Shows what I know. couple of uh, quick uh, social media. Jim Forrest says there's a whole cemetery of Biden family skeletons in Ukraine. The U.S. will fight tooth and claw to keep dollar hegemony. That's the real story. Jim, it is the real story. That's why we've got not one but two specialists in that field on this very show this evening. And A.B. says... Your thoughts about the video published a couple of hours ago, killing Russian soldiers. Ukrainian soldiers are mentally sick, or who are these people? They are demonstrating the lowest level of humanity, shocking, very similar to the soldiers, the ISIS mentality. Sick soldiers. Let's take some calls. Uh, there's Marcus in Chorley on Hunter Biden. Go ahead, Marcus. Well, the whole home to Biden thing, I mean, shouldn't we be looking at the Biden family's relationship to the Ukraine and the uh, Azov Battalion, the funding where that, where that came from in the first place? And then Yeah, well, I, tr I tried to do that in my opening remarks. Please develop them by all means. But, but then, then there's the, uh, the, the squaddy... The, uh, ex-military, English, Australian, American, they're going out there to fight and they're not being supplied with weapons, not being supplied with gear. If you look on a, uh, on a YouTube channel called Chris Thrall, he, uh, he has, a, he has a, a segment called It's a Trap. And American yeah, I saw Australian that. I saw that. I, I'll tell you my own honest view, Marcus. Uh, they'd quite like it if these foreign mercenaries all got killed uh, because they think that it might uh, drag the countries from which these mercenaries came into the war. And I saw some footage today of uh, American mercenaries actually in firefights uh, in Kharkiv this very day. Uh, so there are plenty of foreign mercenaries. Some of them may even be. Uh, serving uh, military personnel from Western armies that are pretending to be mercenaries that have gone AWOL uh, with, a, with a Nelson's yeah. eye being uh, turned to them. Marcus, last word to you. My also thought on this is, I was about, because the world is collapsing, we get all the handy lads into an area where we can blame Vladimir Putin for taking them out because we didn't supply them with what we told them we're going to supply them with. So yeah, you've got it's funny that they're all concentrated in such large numbers in readily accessible targets. You're right. Marcus, thanks for the call. Now, uh, tomorrow night, I'll be in Liverpool. And my next call is from the great city of Liverpool. Ray is on the line on Biden. Go ahead, Ray. Oh, um, yeah, hi, George. Um, I want to speak about, like, um, you know, Joe Biden. I, I just don't, I just think that um, Joe Biden is not a good leader for America. I just don't think he's a, he's a strong candidate for the Democratic Party in America. And I think, like, in um, when it comes, like, 2024, I just think Trump will um, be saying Biden in that election, you know what I mean? Uh, he'll, he'll marmalize them. Uh, that, yeah. what you said, is typical English understatement. Uh, Joe Biden is worse than the five worst American presidents uh, put together. Uh, he, he literally can barely uh, speak the words that are hung in front of him that were written by other people. And then he goes off piste, they say, and makes uh, remarks that he doesn't mean, like the 82nd Airborne, though I haven't seen that one walked back. Uh, but the regime change was walked back by the White House immediately after he said it. And today, a procession of uh, blue chip, blue tick uh, establishment toadies, like Frank Gardner, the security uh, correspondent of the BBC, have opined that it's really not helpful, uh, the White House having to com continually walk back loose talk from the president. Uh, but all Joe Biden did, I believe, was, as I put it, say the quiet part out loud. Last word to you, Ray. Yeah, I'm d I just um, want to like, speak about, like, you know, with um, Putin, I, I just think, like, um, 
the West is attacking Putin, like him saying, like, oh, Putin's like evil, he's, he's a psychopath. But I think one of the things Putin wants, I think he wants Ukraine to join the Soviet Union. Well, there is no that's Soviet what, Union what. to join. Uh, Joe Biden, who, by the way, dodged the draft five times, even more than Donald Trump, five times, four student deferments and one medical deferment. And yet he's lived such a long and active life in American politics. His health must have miraculously improved. Joe Biden, who would have done anything to avoid fighting himself, is ready, more than ready, to fight to the last drop of blood of other people. Uh, thanks for that. Um, now, I'm in Liverpool tomorrow with my Killing Kelly film. You, you can't get tickets, not for the last month you couldn't get tickets for that, but you can still get tickets for my Oxford Town Hall showing of Killing Kelly, which is next month, the 25th, I think. Although they're going very quickly now, so yeah, there it is, Monday 25th of April at 7 p.m. I'll be presenting the film and I'll be taking Q&A afterwards. So if you want to meet me there, if you want to see this film, it's a very important one, please get your tickets uh, now. Kieran is in Waterford in Ireland, where my dear mother on this Mother's Day came from. Happy Mother's Day, Ma. Go ahead, Kieran. How are you, George? Listen, I just, do you know what? I'm so, it sounds crazy to say in this day and age, but I'm really genuinely worried for the end of the world. I really am. We have a national broadcaster, as you know, over here called RTE, and there's a, there's a talk show guy on every day, Monday to Friday. His name is Joe Duffy. Since this started, and I said, I made a point to the woman that took me call when I first rang up. It's the same with Donald Trump. I'm not a Donald Trump fan, but what they did was they pick, and this is what you do, you pick an enemy, and you say really bad things about them, you get enough people to hate this person, and then you can say anything and do anything and enforce anything, and the people will follow you. And I made a point while I was waiting to, 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 to get the call answered. Uh, an old Twilight Zone uh, black and white uh, uh, episode came into my head. It's called Monsters a Jew on Maple Street. It, it was made in the 50s, early 60s, I think. And what they do is it's a suburban street in America, and it's just it shows uh, the, the premise of the, of the episode is it shows how easy it is to control people and manipulate people and make people enemies, your neighbours enemies, and what it is, it is aliens it's the toilet zone, aliens, they, they land on a, yeah. on a hill, and they start messing, yeah. they turn the power off on, on, on this one street, and then at, when the night comes, they turn the lights on on one, on one house, and they say, no look, it's Mary it's Mary, she's doing it, and then they turn off Mary's lights and turn on John's lights, and th it shows how easy it is to even make people attack their neighbours, their friends, their family. We have a, on this talk show, Joe Duffy, at, when, when, when this started, he had a guy rang up that said he was a soldier. I don't know where, he could have been a fella, I don't know, he could have been a lunatic with a tinfoil hat. He said he was a soldier, and there's a guy in London is taking CVs from around the world, and if you can prove that you're a real soldier, he arranges you to go to Ukraine to fight. This guy said, I'm not only going to go on my own, he said, I've hired out a few hotels around Ireland, he said, we're having a, a few seminars, and I'm going to, get, I'm going to build a unit of soldiers to go to Ukraine and fight. These, this is what is happening around the world. We yeah, are taking I'll tell you what, though, Friday. Kieran, Ki yeah, Kieran uh, just because the hour uh, is coming to a close, I need to interrupt you, but make this point. I think it's working in Ireland and it's working in Britain better than it's working in the United States. Because if it was working in the United States, then Joe Biden's poll ratings would have gone up, not catastrophically plunged further, down to 33%. 33%, the lowest ever for an American president in the first half of his presidential term, and ominously close uh, to the next elections that can take power away from Biden's party, and almost certainly will. So, the question is, why are we the stupid ones in Britain, in Ireland, when the Americans that we always thought were less smart than us, let us put it that way, have seen through the game much more quickly? Now look, coming up in the next hour, Fiorella Isabel, the independent journalist and political analyst and co-host of The Convo Couch. But first, it's the news with Elliot King.
President Emmanuel Macron has distanced himself from the US President Joe Biden's comments that Vladimir Putin cannot remain in power. Macron is urging efforts to de-escalate tensions and has spoken several times to the Russian president in so far unsuccessful peacemaking efforts. He is due to speak again to President Putin either today or tomorrow. When asked about Biden's remarks, President Macron told France 3 Television we should be factual and do everything so that, en that the situation doesn't get out of control. He added he would use a different turn of phrase to the US president in a bid to end the war without escalation. The French president said he plans to talk with Mr Putin about a proposed humanitarian corridor for the besieged city of Mariupol, also discussed with Turkey and Greece. Following President Biden's unscripted remark, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken denied that the United States has any plans to bring about the regime change in Russia or anywhere else. Blinken's comments came a day after President Biden said his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin should not be allowed to remain in power. Biden made the remark at the end of a speech in Poland. Blinken said the president simply made the point that Putin could not be allowed to wage war against Ukraine. The Kremlin had dismissed Biden's remark, saying it was for Russians to choose their leader. During a visit to Israel today, Blinken told reporters that the US does not have a strategy of regime change in Russia or anywhere else. More elderly people in Britain are now being admitted to hospital with COVID than they were at the peak of the Omicron wave, according to latest official data. The statistics from the UK Health Secretary Agency will add urgency to the new drive to vaccinate the over 75s with a spring booster. Although hospitalisation rates in younger patients are also rising, they are still below the level of the original Omicron surge. Foo Fighters drummer Taylor Hawkins had 10 different substances in his system when he died, including marijuana, opioids and antidepressants, Colombian officials have confirmed. In 2001, Hawkins suffered a heroin overdose that left him in a coma for over a week. Preliminary results of the urine toxicology test found he had ingested marijuana, antidepressants and benzodiazepines and opioids, the Attorney General's office has said. Hawkins, aged 50, had been with the rest of the band in the country's capital, Bogota, when he died in a hotel room on Friday. The band had been due to perform at the Estereo Picnic Festival near Bogota on the night of his death, but have now cancelled the rest of its Amer South American tour. El Salvador's parliament has approved a state of emergency after the Central American country recorded dozens of gang-related murders in a single day. Police said there had been 62 murders on Saturday, making it the most violent 24-hour period since the end of the Civil War in 1992. New laws restrict the right to gather, allow arrests without a warrant, and the monitoring of communications. Last year, the gang plague nation recorded 1,140 murders, a 30-year low, but in November, another spate of violence led to more than 40 people being killed within three days. The UK's glorious spring weather is about to come to an abrupt halt with snow and temperatures of minus 5 centigrade forecast. The Met Office said the UK will become colder, cloudier and more unsettled from tomorrow. Temperatures during the day will halve from the highs reached last week and fall below freezing overnight as a cold front pushes down from the north. It comes after many areas basked in glorious sunshine and highs of 20 centigrade last week. Hollywood is gearing up for its biggest night of the year. Stars get ready to attend the 94th Academy Awards, the Oscars, in Los Angeles later today. Will Smith, Benedict Cumberbatch, Dame Judi Dench and Troy Kotsur are among the nominees in the acting categories. Director Jane Champion's Western, The Power of the Dog, leads the field with 12 nominations going into the ceremony. Faces stiff competition for top awards, however, best picture from Apple's TV's Coda and Sir Kenneth Branagh's British drama, Belfast. One of the favourites for the acting award is Will Smith, who has never won an Oscar despite 30 years in the industry. The 53-year-old has come close twice, being nominated for Ali and The Pursuit of Happiness. This year, he is the hot favourite to make it third time lucky for portraying the father of future tennis champions Serena and Vin Venus Williams in King Richard. And finally, a prisoner who escaped wearing nothing but his underwear and socks is now believed to have changed his appearance. 
Dorset police say Kyle Darren Eglinton assaulted a security officer in Hardy Road Pool on Saturday before making off from a prison van. Searches are continuing and officers believe since absconding he has shaved his head and beard. The forces said he should not be approached. The 32-year-old has been remanded in custody at Paul Magistrates Court after being charged with robbery following an incident in Bournemouth on Thursday. Following searches, police believe he may have been in the West Ho area of Bournemouth in the early hours of this morning. Chief Inspector Neil Wright said, We believe that he may have changed his appearance significantly. However, he did not say whether he had changed his underwear. That's all your most news. I'm Elliot King. <laughs> Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge where there are no tuition fees. Has Joe Biden lost his mind over Putin regime change? Yes, 87%, no 13. And on YouTube, yes, 93, no 7. And on Telegram, 97, no 3. It is overwhelming, and thousands and thousands of you have voted. You could do so, I think, to the end of the show. So get your votes in now on my Twitter feed, on my YouTube channel, and on my Telegram channel. Now, my next guest is an Internet sensation. She has a massive following and a massive audience in the United States, and you're about to find out exactly why. She's Fiorella Isabel. She's an independent journalist and a political analyst and co-host of the wonderfully named Convo Couch. Fiorella, welcome to the mother of all talk shows. Wonderful to see you. I've uh, admired your work, and I'm glad that we uh, managed to get you on the show tonight, not least because one of your preoccupations is increasingly becoming mine. You see, it is imagined, <laughs> at least it was before, uh, Afghanistan and the, the, the flight from Kabul, uh, the, the United States hegemony is based on their military. But actually, their military have not won a war since 1945, and it really wasn't them that won that. Uh, their military is the least of their hegemonic powers. The real cause of their hegemony is the dollar hegemony, the dollar as king. I believe that, and I think you believe that too. Am I right? Yes, exactly. I mean, the reason why this uh, proxy war with Russia, that's what it is, via Ukraine is happening is because they want control of Eurasia. They want control of the region. And they also want control of the natural resources that are a part of the region. The problem with this attempt right now is that when Biden made those remarks in Poland, when he said that Putin shouldn't be the president of Russia, he was blatantly calling out regime change. But the tide has shifted. There has been a shift from unilateralism to multipo multipolarism. So, like, a multipolarity that exists in this world is going to be completely different. It doesn't have the United States and NATO at the helm calling all the shots. It's going to have more of a cooperative uh, agenda where you can literally, you can tell that the global South, India, China, have fallen in line uh, on the side of Russia in terms of, of looking at it as an economic alliance, if anything, because that's where the money is right now with China pushing the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's the the, the people in, in um, if you're looking at it geopolitically as an analyst, you see, you see that shift happening and you see that it's an economic shift, uh, especially with the Nordstrom pipeline and with everything that is uh, China is providing to a lot of people. I've been in the Global South, I've been in Nicaragua, and I've seen the excitement that is coming from people in Nicaragua in terms of the economic relationship that they will have with China versus the United States and the sanctions they've imposed on all of these countries that have not worked out favorably. The sanctions imposed by the United States on Russia have drastically affected the prices 
of um, food and oil, but specifically not not because there's a scarcity of, of, of product, but because of the inflation. And so this was going to happen anyway. But of course, they're, they're urging uh, Americans to blame Russia and Putin. And they've even had a uh, TikTok like Jen Psaki and another uh, national security advisor had a TikTok, uh, uh, an event where they told all the TikTokers that Putin was at fault for the rise in their gas prices. So they're like, it's not really, it's not really working though, Fiorella. It's not working, no. especially on the economy, especially on the economy. The latest numbers today are that only 33% of Americans approve of Joe Biden's handling of the economy. And as I said a few weeks ago, even if they did believe this was Putin's fault, there's nothing they can do about Putin. But they can do something about Joe Biden. And in November, they get one big, mighty chance to do that. Yeah, I mean... November is going to show a drastic shift towards the right because of a lot of reasons, because of the mandates, because of the ineffectiveness of Joe Biden. But at the same time, Americans are largely understanding that their elections are not representative, that their elections are mostly a facade and theatrical. We have a two-party system that's really an illusion. It's a one-party system where we live in an oligarchy. The same companies own the same uh, corporations. You have the two biggest, blank, uh, Vanguard and BlackRock, that own everything else. And then from those companies, um, you have the so-called competition of the free market that doesn't really exist in the United States. So you have the election, electoral system working the same way. So when people increasingly talk about electoral politics, many people feel that it's kind of a dead end that it's just all PR, that these people are all narrative managers, that they, they're just there to, to sort of put out the narrative, but they're not really calling the shots. If you look at who's calling the shots right now, Anthony Blinken's statement after what Joe Biden said shows you that they don't want the quiet part said out loud like Joe Biden just did. They want to wrap it up in some sort of rhetoric and virtue signal where they can get away with with saying they're going into uh, save Ukraine and provide democracy. But Joe Biden isn't as, as eloquent a speaker as Barack Obama or others previous to him, kind of like Donald Trump was. And so he said the quiet part out loud. And now they have to sort of manage that and, and act like this isn't going to be you know, this isn't what it is. But we know for the longest time the United States has wanted to remove Vladimir Putin from power and that they have wanted, they have this McCarthyite sort of sentiment that they've been pushing since the 1950s that, of course, came about with Russia Gate and, and that failed narrative. But this is a whole other uh, level that they're trying to do in terms of propaganda, the lies they have put out, the censorship of RT and the mass censorship of anything labeled as Russia state affiliated media, the complete erasure of it all from YouTube. I mean, this is something that is unprecedented and I haven't seen this level of propaganda yet before. No, much. not me. And I've been watching it uh, much longer than you. Uh, but that's because it has to. Uh, the credibility of the state in your country and in mine, and I think in many countries, in what we call the West, but which is actually merely the periphery of Eurasia, 10% of the population of the whole world live in the West. When we talk about the international community, we are actually talking about the governments of 10% of the world's population. Uh, I, I was thinking when you were talking there that the, the Shanghai Cooperation Treaty Organization alone, just that, contains 50% of the world's population and 50% of the world's wealth. And this swing is getting faster and faster. And Biden and the European government's sanctions will accelerate it, won't they? Yeah, the, the, the sanctions are, again, are immediately, are, you know, hurt Russia. The sanctions immediately did, did, had some sort of effect. But in the long run, Russia has other markets. Russia has China. Russia has India. I mean, India and Russia traded rupees to rubles. 
you also have Pakistan even coming in and saying that it was great that India remained a sovereign nation. You had um, Imran Khan say that. And these, these two countries have long been arch nemesis. So what you're seeing is there's so much support in the global south for what Russia is doing, somebody standing up to the U.S. and NATO. And of course, we know that this didn't happen just when Vladimir Putin decided to, you know, invade uh, Russia. I, I, I don't like to call it even that because to me, he's just responding to an aggression, red lines that were laid out a long time ago that the United States knew about that NATO knew about, and they decided to completely throw them off. Not to mention the fact that Americans didn't care about the 14,000 people dying in the Donbass region for the last eight years. They they absolutely had no idea where any of this was that any of this was happening. They couldn't even point to Ukraine on a map. They couldn't point to any of that on a map until the media told them to to start caring about it. Just like the media told them, like before that the anti uh, the, the people that weren't vaccinated were the enemy then it shifted to okay let me put my profile picture of of a ukrainian flag and that's how media works in the united states of america and unfortunately for the average american all they're going to see is and all they're seeing right now is their food prices go up at the grocery store their gas prices go up and they're starting to ask questions they're starting to say wait a minute why does i why do i have to care about what's going on in Ukraine. And I mean, that's the average American sentiment. Like they don't understand foreign policy. That's one of our biggest problems, even in the progressive, you know, what they call progressive over here, uh, which isn't really progressive, but the progressive Democrats, they hardly ever talk about foreign policy. So it, it's that sort of thing where it, I think once it hits them in the pockets, it, it's going to, they're going to start pushing back. And we're seeing a little bit of that pushback already, where Biden's approval rating, as you mentioned before the program, has drastically dropped. And I think he's going to be sort of a fall guy, considering the New York Times just admitted that the Hunter Biden story that everybody was censored for talking about is actually a real thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about his, uh, his prospects, uh, actually, uh, although I despise them. Uh, I wonder uh, about what they're going to do next, uh, because they plainly are embarrassed by him. They plainly would like a safer pair of hands at the tiller. They worry greatly about Kamala Harris. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is surely out of the question. They're in a bind, actually, as to uh, what to do next. Uh, tell us, uh, Fiorella, how can people uh, watch your uh, stuff? How can they support you? So I am on Twitter at Fiorella Isabel M, and you can find my stuff on Rockfin. It's R-O-K-F-I-N. It's a cryptocurrency-based platform. I put it out first because YouTube is censoring everybody and everything. Uh, you can find us on YouTube at The Combo Couch. And, um, yeah, you can just check out my Substack that I also write there, too. Thank you so much for having me on, and I, I'm glad. No, thank you. Uh, it'll not be, it won't be the last time. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on board the mother of all talk shows. Has Joe Biden lost his mind over Putin regime change? You can vote on Twitter, on YouTube, and on Telegram. Over 7,000 of you have so far. You've still got um, an hour and a half or more uh, to cast your vote. It ain't looking good for senile Joe. Another couple of social media uh, contributions. AD says, Dear George, I'd first like to commend your hard work in offering the public an alternative way of accessing world news, which is extremely important, taking into account all the propaganda circulating, especially now. Thank you very much for that. He goes on to say, I have a question regarding the Kosovan war. Taking into account the atrocities that were being committed by the forces of the Slobodan Milosevic regime, what would you have done in that situation? I agree, he says, that the NATO bombings of Yugoslavia which killed no less than 1,200 civilians, according to the Yugoslav government, was absolutely disgusting. My question is, would you have intervened, given the fact that thousands of Kosovan civilians, such as women and children, were being killed and raped? That's a false a premise, of course, Adol, as I think you quite possibly know. 
uh, there were not thousands of Kosovans being killed and raped. And that's out of the same uh, drawer as the reason for going into Libya, uh, given by NATO, uh, that uh, thousands of Libyans were about to be slaughtered, that Gaddafi had given Viagra to his army, such as it was, uh, to encourage them to go out and rape uh, Libyan women in Benghazi, in the east of the country. It was all a lie. Now, I know a lot about Kosovo, as it happens. In the 1990s, I was uh, one of the very few parliamentarians in Britain who knew whether uh, a Kosovar was something that you drove, licked, or ate. I knew about Kosovo. I opposed the ending of the autonomy of Kosovo by Milosevic. But to say that NATO intervened because thousands of Kosovans were being killed and raped is simply false and is giving, whether you intended it to or not, a justification for the remorseless bombing of your own country. By the way, how's Kosovo doing now as a NATO protectorate? Uh, let's take a uh, question. The question is on this, uh, in 1963, in this week, a report to the UK Parliament haha, recommended that a quarter of the rail network should be cut. Very smart, wasn't it? What was the surname of the author of it? Idiot, fool, or, or imbecile? No. Was it A, Beeching, B, Hector, C, Wiggins? Answer after a very short break. There is no trick other than hard work, creativity, care, and recognizing that duty is more important than love. The booming voice of Robert Maxwell, an arrogant man who used his publishing empire to gain him power and influence. But in this shocking account, never told before in this way, George Galloway recalls his first encounter with Maxwell. It looked like a, a grizzly bear uh, advancing towards me and punches me with these giant fists like sides of ham right in the solar plexus so hard that I literally bent double then after George exposed Maxwell as a crook in parliament it was war every one of his papers the daily mirror then following the Sunday mirror the Sunday people the daily record then a few days later the Sunday mail in Scotland even the European which he then owned all over Galloway. Scottish Daily News journalist Ron Mackay was there. Every night, presumably when he had a drink in him, he would boom over the tannoy about the the, 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 the cretins, the fools. The, the majority of the workforce believed that he would take it over and their jobs would be secure. But of course he didn't. He just disappeared. And then... Millionaire newspaper publisher Robert Maxwell is dead. What really happened? Did Robert Maxwell jump or was he pushed? It could be that he went out to, as he did, micturate over the side of the boat. I'm with Ghislaine Maxwell in that I lean towards the murder. This is Maxwell the monster. You said what is my secret. I will let you and your viewers know what it is. I'm not attached to property. Consequently, losing or gaining it means nothing to me. Ha! The Maxwell story and it ain't over yet, of course. Uh, the Ghislaine Maxwell story isn't over yet, and we haven't yet got the truth about Robert Maxwell. Uh, now, you can get that on my Patreon uh, page, which is patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. There's loads of brand new material going on there now, right as we speak. A big catalogue of the speeches I gave 
20 years ago in the run-up to the Iraq war. If you were at any of the hundreds of meetings with, I don't know, a 100,000 people perhaps came to see me speak all over the country in the run-up to the Iraq war 19 years ago, and uh, they were all filmed, uh, and they're now in HD. And you might see what you looked like 20 years ago. Personally, I look better than I did 20 years ago. I'm the same weight now that I was when I entered Parliament at the age of 32, uh, 35 years ago. But you might want to see what you looked like at that meeting. You might want to relive that public meeting. So that's going up uh, on my Patreon page, as is my audio book on the 1970s. The 1970s was a great decade. Don't let anyone tell you differently. In fact, if a decade could uh, sue for defamation, the 1970s would never be done uh, suing. Now, uh, I said, I told you at the beginning, we can't afford to do a midweek moats uh, this week. We'll have to pause it uh, until we are able to put the financial wherewithal together to do it. That's a great pity because the audience uh, so far is on track to have been more than 800,000. Uh, so uh, here's what I'm going to do instead. I'm going to broadcast at 10 p.m. on Wednesday, a kind of war report, a summary of events uh, at uh, on my YouTube channel because that doesn't cost me anything. I'll just broadcast with one camera, me and my missus, uh, at 10 p.m. on Wednesday. So I do hope that you will join me there. That's 10 p.m. on Wednesday, a kind of midweek mini moats without all of this fancy paraphernalia. I do hope that you will uh, join me. Uh, now, can I go to Simon in London? I didn't give the answer. The answer was, of course, beaching. Uh, the same as it was the last time I asked you that question, just a few months ago. Uh, Simon, in London, on Russia. Go ahead, Simon. How are you doing, George? You okay? All good. What would you like that's to say, great, sir? That's great. Be before, before I start, I just wanted to say, um, it's, I'm a libertarian, as you know, so it's rather odd for me to say this, but perhaps like Max Kaiser made you rich with, uh, with, with Bitcoin, perhaps you can ma make me rich in a similar way, because I actually bought your Fidel Castro handbook the other day, and it's actually quite good. Okay. Um, I can't give precious. you Bitcoin uh, advice, though. I, I didn't no, even no. know what I was buying. I only but did now, it because Max told me to. Yeah, but I'm hoping it get, uh, your book gets banned with this, all this cancel culture, so that perhaps the <laughs> price will shoot up, and I'll become a billionaire, who knows? But it's a rather interesting book. <laughs> I must smart. tell your readers to, uh, to you. read it. Uh, there's a particularly nice Thank you. Part yeah, it's it. available uh, from uh, my shop. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It, reason, it's beautiful. The, the pictures in it are beautiful. Never mind the words. Yeah. The pictures, everything about it is beautiful. There's a particularly good part in it where Malcolm X, um, uh, uh, basically, Fidel Castro was refused hotel room, and Malcolm X, basically, when, when he came to the United States, and Malcolm X, the great man kind of gave him a, a place to stay while he was in uh, United States for, for a while, just uh, while he was there. Right. Kind of shows right. uh, a, a very touching picture uh, uh, between the two there. The reason for my cold or Well, let me tell you, let me tell you, Simon, uh, I'll let you come back. Fidel told me that story in the middle of the night at very great length. Uh, I mean, including translation, almost two hours uh, of yeah. the time that he spent with Malcolm X. And I don't know if I say it in the book, but he concluded. Uh, I finally said to him, so what's your summary of Malcolm X? And he thought for a minute, and then he leant forward. He said, he was a great man, Malcolm, uh, but he was a little bit dangerous. Now, if Fidel yeah. Castro thinks you're a little bit dangerous, you must have been dangerous. Go on, Simon. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I, I, that that quote was in it, by the way. That's the that's was it, that's was it? Okay, picture. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was a, a yeah. great quote as well. But the reason I'm ringing today, after Brexit, we were told all sorts of nonsense that we'd have free trade, would be unshackled from the European uh, uh, Union, we wouldn't have to follow their rules anymore, we'd be fr uh, free to trade, we would have lower taxes, all this nonsense. And as I said, as a libertarian, I'm, I'm interested in that. But unfortunately, we didn't get a damn thing. You know, we didn't get anything. Now, with regards to, uh, uh, and if anything, what they've done, Whitehall, Whitehall have tied us 
to the uh, to the European Union laws by just copy uh, carrying out the biggest copy and paste operation probably known to mankind. So none of that has changed. And effectively, we've adopted these green policies, which even Nigel Farage said we didn't ask for. We didn't ask for these green policies. So effectively, we're we're, we're being dragged in now. Take Russia as an example. Russia's been kind of kicked out of the uh, EU. They were well, in the EU, from my understanding, but they're, they're, they've been ostracised recently for through no fault of their own. Uh, and what they've done is they've increased their trade. They've actually got much, much richer. They're making a couple of billions of pounds every day. The trade with India, Pakistan, and, uh, and and China, as well as other countries, numerous other countries, will go up. You know, and this is exactly what we wanted for Britain. And that we, we, yeah, we well, uh, it's exactly it's exactly what I wanted for Britain. I said at the time, you may have heard me. Uh, Brexit is a necessary but not sufficient condition to build the Britain that we can have and should have. Uh, we got the Brexit, but we don't have the government to make the best use uh, of that Brexit. As a matter of fact, it's not made any real use of the Brexit at all. You're right about that. It's done absolutely nothing, George. And not only that, I think a better question for people to vote on would have been, uh, although in my opinion, I don't know what, what your opinion on this, because any politician in the UK who would have uh, kind of asked the people this would probably have been assassinated. Uh, so I think I think the question would probably have been, a better question would probably have been, do we want to uh, do you want to vote for Brexit or not? And also, do we want to stay in NATO or not? Because NATO. And Trump was quite right in saying this. NATO is the biggest waste of money. I mean, that, that we're involved in at the moment. All our taxpayers' money goes to NATO, uh, to these bureaucrats and these these weapons companies and so on. And it's just none of it. None of it goes to the actual causes. Someone will say. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, t- I'll, I'll tell. You, I'll tell you what, Simon. I don't know if you really are a libertarian. I, t- I suggest you take a look at my party. You might find. Uh, that it is uh, more to your taste. Uh, line two, Chris in Stevenage. Go ahead, Chris. All right, George, how are you doing? All right, glad to hear from you. What would you like to say? I would like to say, first of all, George, I agree with a lot of what you say. I think our government is a waste of space. The whole lot of them out of Parliament should be... All of a crime will chuck them out. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm afraid I'm inclined to agree with you, Yes. No, I mean, I'm serious, George. The, the whole lot has gone, they're just so woke, it's unbelievable. But uh, the reason I phoned you up is this. I watched your uh, program during the week. You know, you have a, a little mini program. Yeah, the midweek extra, yeah. Yeah, and it said about, you said about uh, the, the pictures coming out of uh, Ukraine is fake. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, actually, actually, Chris, one of them took the biscuit yesterday. It's, it purported to be a Russian helicopter being shot down. Beautiful shot yeah, it was. That, and a big, big fireball. A big fireball. It was actually a computer game. It was a computer yeah, game I've sequence. That, I'm aware of them. I've seen a lot of them. Yeah. But you can't deny, like, uh, ordinary buildings and civilians are getting destroyed with it. Uh, well, many civilians and buildings are being destroyed, of course. Not as many as yeah. uh, in Baghdad when we, d- when we invaded. Uh, in fact, by this stage of the war in Iraq, launched by us and the United States, 400,000 civilians were dead. 400,000 no, civilians I'm not, I'm not were dead. I'm not denying that. But, I mean, you got to see what are they doing? What is the point of this? They're all brothers and sisters. Well, the point, the point of it, the, the point of it is, was stated before it began, uh, that, uh, the failure to implement the Minsk agreement meant that the forces, led by fascists, by the way, uh, along the line of control, with the Donbass, were about to fall upon the people there like wolves. They'd already killed 14,000, and they were about a day uh, from invading, a full-force invasion, and carrying out a massacre. And so that's the first point, failure to implement the Minsk Agreement. Second point, a determination to join NATO. Russia will never accept 
Ukraine in NATO. That was never going to happen, Joel. It was never going to well, happen. Well, well, well uh, you say that, but you're not a Russian charged with the security of your country. You can say that from Stevenage quite comfortably, and if you're wrong, it won't make a, a row of beans of a difference. But if you have the responsibility of defending Russia, and you see NATO training bases, and NATO bio-warfare labs popping up all over your country, and you see weapons pouring in from NATO countries into Ukraine, you may well conclude, well, Ukraine's not in NATO, but NATO surely is in Ukraine. And if you had responsibility for Russia's national security, I'm perfectly sure that you would have taken the same decision. And I know that uh, any government worth its salt would never allow a hostile military camp to establish itself on their borders. Just ask yourself, Chris, would we allow uh, Chinese-Russian military bases in Ireland or in an independent Scotland? Would America allow Chinese and Russian bases in Mexico or in Canada or in both? Would we? You know that we would not. You know that. No. Think about it. But Think China, about they've it. They've got their things in them places already. What? What? They've got these things in them places already. They've got Russian and Who's Chinese there? bases in Ireland. In Ireland. They probably have. Yeah, they probably bought out wherever they came was going to make money for them. You're saying on international television that there's probably Russian and Chinese military bases in Ireland, in Mexico, in Canada. Are you really saying that, Chris? Yeah, I am. There you go, then. There's no accounting for taste. That's Chris in Ward 5 of the Institute for the Criminally Insane. Uh, now, here is the next. Do I go to the call? Let me give me a... Can I get Eddie in Manchester up? Can you do that? Can you do Eddie? Okay, go ahead, Ed. Eddie, welcome. Hi, George. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thanks very much. George, I'm a first-time caller, uh, and I just wanted to say straight off the bat that your rectitude, integrity, humour is unrivaled in any of the mainstream media. Round of applause to you. I admire you. Thank you, you very greatly. much. Thank you very much, one. Eddie. God bless you. God bless you. And Thank uh, you very much. God bless you too. And may God give you strength, long life, keep up the good work. I also want to say a round of applause to your co workers. I mean, three and a half hour show uh, every Wednesday yeah, and Sunday. Yeah. Especially, especially twice a week. Yeah, uh, especially twice a week. Yeah. And yeah. on a shoestring, believe me. None of, them, yeah. none of them are getting the money that they should. Yeah. Eddie, there's only one thing that could make me love you more. Are you a United oh. supporter? I'm a, I, I have to admit, George, I don't really watch football. The only time I watch football is every four years when it comes to Euro and it comes to the World Cup, just to see who's the European champion. Well, tell know. me this. Now that you've mentioned the World Cup, I didn't have time to do so earlier. The Daily Telegraph has called on Scotland and Wales to step down from the World Cup qualifiers so that Ukraine could get a bye right through to the finals in Qatar. As I pointed out, by that logic, we should just present them with the World Cup now because if you shouldn't play against them and thus possibly defeat them, well, that might, that might as well go the whole... Why don't we give them the Eurovision Song Contest and the Euros and the World Cup and Wimbledon? Why don't we just give them all now and not bother turning up with the rest? Eddie... God bless you. We've had 119 calls so far tonight. Uh, the switchboard is rammed. And my two family members are doing a wonderful, wonderful job. Here's the next question. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan was shot by lone gunman John Hinckley. He did it to impress an actress. Who was she? A. Charlotte Rampling. B. Michelle Pfeiffer. C. Jodie Foster. Answer after this very brief break.
gosh darn, how do you get this thing to work? Uh, is it that one? Is it, is it this one here? Gosh, was this thing built in America? Jeez. Kamala, would you get in here? I can't get the, uh, gosh darn wireless to work. <laughs> You know I can't answer questions, Joe, when I'm laughing. Uh, I'm uh, trying to, uh, listen to that Scottish guy on the wireless. The, uh, the, the Galloway fella. Oh, Joe, you're so funny. <laughs> I've been pressing this red button on and off and on and off. Heck, I can't get it to work. Uh, hello, Biden residents. Mr. President, be advised, we have executed the airstrike on Syria. <laughs> That's just great. Uh, how long until it gets delivered? I'm starving. There's a call. Go ahead, Kenny. Hi, George. Yeah, I just want to talk about the trans issue that you were speaking about earlier. Yeah, I've got go a book ahead. in front of me by uh, Douglas Murray, and he's got a paragraph here. So I'd just like to redo it if that's okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I was standing on the corner <laughs> at a quarter. All right, I'll, 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 I'll get him off. Get him off. He's a nutter. He's a nutter. In the UK, it's 08081965522. And in the US, it's plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. John Hinckley shot Ronald Reagan to impress Jodie Foster. I don't know how he thought he was going to make any progress with her for a variety of reasons. Has Joe Biden lost his mind over Putin regime change? You can vote on my Twitter account, on my YouTube channel, please subscribe, and on my Telegram channel. And if you are on my Telegram channel, you've already subscribed. But I'm asking every one of you, because that is my last resort. If anything happens to my output, that's the last place that you will find me. So please, it's telegram uh, t.me forward slash George Galloway. Arthur Crabtree says, well, they saw how easily they could turn people into commercial cultists and applied it to politics. Fair point. And Fundamentals says, when Biden did his epic war speech yesterday, I think he forgot where he was thought he was on the set of an epic war movie. And Samuel Taylor, Samuel Taylor says, seems to me you have lost your mind with your uncritical support for your friend uh, Putin. Tell you what, Samuel, here's my number. 08 081 96 22. Come on air and say that. Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. And Phil here from Liverpool says, you're at the table with the leaders of Ukraine and Russia, a mediator, if you will. How would you start the talks and what would you advise? I'm interested to know. Well, I think the demands that I adumbrated not half an hour ago uh, are the uh, essential demands. And if they're not met, then they'll have to be enforced. They could have been met before the war began. They will be met one way or another, either by conquest or by agreement, and it's better if it's by agreement, don't you think? Not least because it would mean that not another person would have to die in this war. Uh, let's go to the calls. Lee is in Harrow in London. Go ahead, Lee. Hi, George. How's it going? All good. Thanks for calling. What would you like to say? Um, so, I was going to actually speak about Biden, Hunter Biden, but just on your poll itself, interesting uh, uh, kind of choice of words there. I think generally, um, 
uh, senior Biden has lost his mind um, across the board. And because he's lost his mind, he's actually saying things that traditionally America would keep quite covert, that this has been about That's regime the point. change. That's the point. It's not that he's lost his mind, so he's talking rubbish. He's lost his mind, so he's telling the truth. Yeah, I do believe he's telling the truth. And I believe that there's a really shoddy, it's a bit like the biolab thing. You know, they let the cat out of the bag and there's a shoddy attempt to cover up these these things. And and the, the thing that astonishes me is that this cover-up is so flimsy, but yet people believe the cover-up. I've seen yeah, yeah, journalists across yeah. the board um, falling yeah. over themselves to say, oh, it wasn't meant to be said like that. And I just think, really? Um, but in terms of um, when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, um, we said at that time that this is pretty much game over. Um, it's it's pretty obvious that Zelensky is, you know, out of his depth. And, and I feel that he's he, this hero worshipping. He's let it get to. He's let. There's a script. He had a role to play, um, but the hero worshipping. He's let it get to his head, and he actually thinks that there are going to be no fly zones, and NATO are going to get involved, and he's going to be the victor in all of this. When actually that wasn't ever a part of the script. He was just a tool, a pawn to be used to try to to get to Putin, to instigate Putin. But Putin is is pretty much in control of this scenario, um, and he's shown that, with the exception of sanctions, there's not much else the West and NATO, U, EU, America can do. For all the rhetoric, there's not much more that they will do or they can do against no, them. No, um, unless they are, unless they are so dedicated to halting the developments that we have spoken about, the Eurasian development, unless they are so determined not to allow China to overtake the United States that they'd rather destroy the world in a nuclear war, uh, then none of these things are going to happen. The 82nd Airborne are not going to make it to Kiev. And if they did, uh, they would get a hot reception there. Uh, the uh, NATO countries are not going to be destroyed for the sake of American hegemony. At least not Germany and France. Some of the others yeah. may have a kamikaze uh, uh, mindset, but uh, Germany and France, and in particular France, uh, you saw that Macron denounced uh, Biden's comments yeah, and he did. said that... Uh, that there's a need to de-escalate this kind of rhetoric, uh, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, uh, so France Macron, is increasingly on EV with it, Lee. But Macron was, was one of the leaders who, at the outset of this, said this has to be, ha right at the beginning, he was one of the ones who said, you know, this has to be handled with diplomacy, it's not all Putin's fault. So he came out with a balanced approach on this from day one. This is before the sanctions or anything. Um, and, and there might be countries like Poland who, who'd, who'd go the whole hog and want an all-out all out war. But I agree with you. I don't think and, – and the thing is, it's not – thankfully, it's not Biden's sole decision. I do believe this whole thing has been engineered. He's a weak leader. Um, his ratings are collapsing. Um, Trump warned us about Hunter Biden all the way through. And I, I yeah, believe he this did. has been he engineered. He was telling the truth. He was, he was, and this has been he engineered. Was the truth. Personally, time, I'd like to see Nancy Pelosi in charge, uh, but only before lunch. Uh, Lee in Harrow, thank you very much indeed for that wonderful call. Casey in Belfast is up next in Ireland. Go ahead, Casey. Hello, how are you, George? Seems to me that. By the grace Joe of God, Biden... good, thank you. Oh, that's great, that's great. Uh, seems to me that Joe Biden is only helping the Republicans to get to government back as soon as there's an election. He's mm. a disastrous leader. He's not only Sleepy Joe, he is, as every Democrat, a murderer, a murderer in disguise. We know how Democrats are. We know what Hillary Clinton did to Libya. We know how they supported the Iraq war. Who was the only, who is the only politician who didn't support the Iraq war in the US? It's Donald Trump. He's the only guy who's actually standing for common sense. And, and in this I think Ukrainian Bernie conflict. Sanders, I think also Bernie Sanders opposed the Iraq war. Well, Bernie Sanders has done nothing but supported the Barack Obama administration and I know now that. the Joe Biden I know that. administration. I know that, but uh, I'm just correcting your point about uh, 
about Trump, and Trump wasn't, uh, of course, a politician in 2003, but you're right, he did uh, oppose the Iraq war. Um, and, uh, and the points that you make, uh, I agree with. It's almost as if uh, Sleepy Joe was a sleeper for uh, the Republicans, uh, because he's done more to guarantee uh, the success of the Republicans, at least in November, uh, than any Republican could have done. Casey, thanks for the call. Matthew is in Montana. Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. Uh, let me first say, literally, it is an honor and a privilege of my lifetime to speak to you on the mother of all talk shows. How kind. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. So uh, basically what I'd like to say, and I have a question for you here, and I've been listening very closely to what you say and have always said, uh, clearly the U.S. is trying to posture itself as the uh, dictatorial overlord of a unipolar world order. Uh, my question is, is that when the smoke clears here and the flames of war are reduced to a smolder, do you think that the U.S. will allow for a multipolar New World Order? Or as you just said a few minutes ago, is this something that could potentially end in disaster due to the United States' seemingly endless display of arrogance and unwillingness to work with anyone in a partnership-type level? I mean, I'm a U.S. citizen, and believe me, I am direly concerned. Well, uh, when you and I were young, that was called the $64,000 question, when $64,000 was worth a lot more than it is today. Uh, the, the, the truth is, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to believe uh, that the United States would let the world come to an end rather than allow Ukraine, that they didn't know where it even was four weeks ago, to be a neutral, demilitarized, denazified country. But you never know. Uh, one thing's for sure, that's how it will end if they don't. If they are determined to maintain American hegemony in the world, that's how it will end. It will end with you and me and our children and our grandchildren dead and our countries smoking ruins of ash and humanity destroyed for eternity. Now, people have to focus clearly on that question. How important is it to you, Mr. and Mrs. Citizen, in the United States and in Britain and Germany and France, and elsewhere around the world, how important is it to you uh, that Ukraine is permitted to join NATO? If you're ready to sacrifice literally everything for that, then you may indeed get your wish. But most people, I'd hazard a guess around 99.9999% of people would say Actually, that's a price I'm not willing to pay. The question is, Matthew, how do we stop? I mean, Joe Biden literally has the button at the bottom of his bed. I wouldn't trust him to button up his pajamas. But he's got a nuclear button at the foot of his bed. Just think about that. Give me some uh, social media uh, here. Um, Peter in the Netherlands says, thank you for your show. One of the last fortresses of free journalism is breaking my heart to recognize the fact that the freedom is dead in my land. There's not a word being said about Hunter Biden. It's amazing. This should be the biggest story in the world. In fact, it is a non-story. Pfizer numbers or neo-Nazi crimes in Ukraine on our TV and anyone brave enough to speak against the government's policy is being arrested. We live in Nazi Germany again. Good God, that's from Peter in the Netherlands. They know a thing or two about Nazi Germany. Zook says, what effect on the UK economy if the world trading currency moves to China? Thank you for your wise words. Well, Zook, we've got a guest coming up that will deal exactly with that question. And Josh Dunn says, I wouldn't be afraid of the end of the world, but I would be afraid of the world that will remain. 
if we can't change the course. And Angela Donegan says the Americans will never ever forgive Biden for the atrocious exit of Afghanistan. They won't support any war he or his party want to go into. And Winston says, imagine calling yourself an anti-imperialist when you platform Russian imperialists like Fiorella, the anti-vaxxer. Well, Winston, I think you've got me bang to rights. I'll have to confess here on television that I'm not an anti-imperialist. In fact, I'm an imperialist agent posing behind a false beard and under an unnecessary hat. And all of my life's work, more than 50 years of my life's work, opposing imperialism has been unmasked by you, Winston, because you don't like Fiorella. What a clown you are. You're too stupid to be watching this show. Switch it off now. If I find who you are, I'll make sure you're switched off. I'll make sure you're blocked from watching this show, Winston. You are a plank. You've won. Fool of the week on the moats. Uh, Kevin's in Grimsby. I'm sure we'll get more sense out of him. Go ahead, Kev. Uh, hello, Ke- uh, hello, George. Look, I think it's very, uh, it's very important um, that um, we all remember the, the, uh, the famous words from one of the good past presidents of the United States of America. He said uh, famously, you can fool all of the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Now, Amen. there was Amen. a report on, on Consortium News. There was a, a report by one of the uh, free correspondents mentioning that I think it was in January last year, NATO had a report which he, he, he leaked, or it wasn't for wide public uh, dissemination, but it said that the report was, it was more or less an operational report, the the object was, the enemy was, or the object was to gain the minds and hearts of people. Don't underestimate the emotions of people. Um, it doesn't matter if the evidence behind, you know, um, is is false. But you have to, and we know in the Western media, they have, they have, I don't like to watch BBC and Sky News anymore. And oh, even Al Jazeera. I can't, I can't possibly. It, it, I, 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 I would no, die even if Al- I, I had to watch these uh, channels, Kevin. But here's my point, And I've made it now twice this evening. How is it that in an era where the truth is available at the touch of a few buttons on your computer. If you've got a computer or an iPhone and you have the ability with your thumb to go looking for the truth, you can find it. You can find consortium news. You can find the mother of all talk shows. You can even still watch RT, despite them laughing, laughably describing it as having been banned. Half of Britain, half of the British audience is watching it via uh, a VPN uh, registered in, in, in India or in Nigeria. Uh, it's easy if you want to find the truth. The question is, why are so many people fooled? Because they can find the truth. Ignorance is a choice in 2022. Why then are so many ready to make the choice? of ignorance. Well, in the last hour, it's the wonderful Rachel Blevins back on the mother of all talk shows and later on China and the dollar. Andy Mock is live. But first the news, of course, with the inimitable Elliot King.
French President Emmanuel Macron has distanced himself from the US President Joe Biden's comments that Vladimir Putin cannot remain in power. Macron is urging efforts to de-escalate tensions and has spoken several times to the Russian president in so far unsuccessful peacemaking efforts. He is due to speak again to President Putin either today or tomorrow. When asked about Biden's remarks, President Macron told France 3 Television, we should be factual and do everything so that, en that the situation doesn't get out of control. He added he would use a different turn of phrase to the US president in a bid to end the war without escalation. The French president said he plans to talk with Mr Putin about a proposed humanitarian corridor for the besieged city of Mariupol, also discussed with Turkey and Greece. Following President Biden's unscripted remark, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken denied that the United States has any plans to bring about the regime change in Russia or anywhere else. Blinken's comments came a day after President Biden said his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin should not be allowed to remain in power. Biden made the remark at the end of a speech in Poland. Blinken said the president simply made the point that Putin could not be allowed to wage war against Ukraine. The Kremlin had dismissed Biden's remark, saying it was for Russians to choose their leader. During a visit to Israel today, Blinken told reporters that the US does not have a strategy of regime change in Russia or anywhere else. More elderly people in Britain are now being admitted to hospital with COVID than they were at the peak of the Omicron wave, according to latest official data. The statistics from the UK Health Secretary Agency will add urgency to the new drive to vaccinate the over 75s with a spring booster. Although hospitalisation rates in younger patients are also rising, they are still below the level of the original Omicron surge. Foo Fighters drummer Taylor Hawkins had 10 different substances in his system when he died, including marijuana, opioids and antidepressants, Colombian officials have confirmed. In 2001, Hawkins suffered a heroin overdose that left him in a coma for over a week. Preliminary results of the urine toxicology test found he had ingested marijuana, antidepressants and benzodiazepines and opioids, the Attorney General's office has said. Hawkins, aged 50, had been with the rest of the band in the country's capital, Bogota, when he died in a hotel room on Friday. The band had been due to perform at the Estéreo Picnic Festival near Bogota on the night of his death, but have now cancelled the rest of its Amer South American tour. El Salvador's parliament has approved a state of emergency after the Central American country recorded dozens of gang-related murders in a single day. Police said there had been 62 murders on Saturday, making it the most violent 24-hour period since the end of the Civil War in 1992. New laws restrict the right to gather, allow arrests without a warrant, and the monitoring of communications. Last year, the gang-plagued nation recorded 1,140 murders, a 30-year low. But in November, another spate of violence led to more than 40 people being killed within three days. The UK's glorious spring weather is about to come to an abrupt halt with snow and temperatures of minus 5 centigrade forecast. The Met Office said the UK will become colder, cloudier and more unsettled from tomorrow. Temperatures during the day will halve from the highs reached last week and fall below freezing overnight as a cold front pushes down from the north. It comes after many areas basked in glorious sunshine and highs of 20 centigrade last week. Hollywood is gearing up for its biggest night of the year. Stars get ready to attend the 94th Academy Awards, the Oscars, in Los Angeles later today. Will Smith, Benedict Cumberbatch, Dame Judi Dench and Troy Kotsur are among the nominees in the acting categories. Director Jane Champion's Western, The Power of the Dog, leads the field with 12 nominations going into the ceremony. Faces stiff competition for top awards, however, best picture from Apple's TV's Coda and Sir Kenneth Branagh's British drama, Belfast. One of the favourites for the acting award is Will Smith, who has never won an Oscar despite 30 years in the industry. The 53-year-old has come close twice, being nominated for R. Lee and The Pursuit of Happiness. This year, he is the hot favourite to make it third time lucky for portraying the father of future tennis champions Serena and Vin Venus Williams in King Richard. And finally, a prisoner who escaped wearing nothing but his underwear and socks is now believed to have changed his appearance. 
Dorset police say Kyle Darren Eglinton assaulted a security officer in Hardy Road Pool on Saturday before making off from a prison van. Searches are continuing and officers believe since absconding he has shaved his head and beard. The forces said he should not be approached. The 32-year-old has been remanded in custody at Paul Magistrates Court after being charged with robbery following an incident in Bournemouth on Thursday. Following searches, police believe he may have been in the West Ho area of Bournemouth in the early hours of this morning. Chief Inspector Neil Wright said, We believe that he may have changed his appearance significantly. However, he did not say whether he had changed his underwear. That's all your Moats News. I'm Elliot King. <laughs> Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. I've got bad news for Will Smith. Zelensky has already got that Oscar in the bag. It doesn't matter that he hasn't made a film for some time, and that film that he did make was, well, quite shocking viewing. I don't recommend it for the faint-hearted Zelensky will win the Oscar and the Ukraine will win the World Cup. In fact, no one, quite possibly, will be allowed to play against them. Has Joe Biden lost his mind over Putin regime change? As someone rolling on the river put it in the social media, you could have stopped it. Has Joe Biden lost his mind? Is the poll, right up until the end of the show, 9,272 people have voted and it is bad news for Joe. That's nearly a record number on the poll. Now, many of you, sadly not enough, have been in touch to say that they'd like to make donations to uh, fund the midweek moats extra that we're having to pause now. Uh, it's really very kind of you, and I'm very touched by it. Uh, but it costs at least £7,500 to make a moats extra. And none of the offers uh, are remotely add up to that. So I've got to uh, say that the moats extra will be paused, but I will be broadcasting free on YouTube at 10 p.m. London time on Wednesday night. I hope that we can bring the extra back, but we can go on uh, running it. Uh, without the uh, financial wherewithal to do it. My good friend, Rachel Blevins, with whom it used to be a delight regularly to talk on RT America, has not been with us for some weeks, and so it is with a song in my heart that I reintroduce the Rose of Texas, Rachel Blevins. Thanks, Rachel, for... Uh, coming back on the show, it is truly wonderful to see you again. And I know I speak for a lot of your fans amongst our uh, audience. I've got to go right, I've got to cut right to the chase. Is your president mentally capable uh, of discharging his office? And if not, shouldn't Amendment 25 to the U.S. Constitution shortly kick in? where his cabinet members decide that after his reckless performance in Poland, he really has to go on medical grounds. Am I completely out of line in suggesting that? Not at all, George. And first, thank you for having me back. It's great to be here on the show. And thank it you. has been a wild week here. And, you know, you point out that he's my president. Unfortunately, this is apparently the best that America has to offer on the world stage. <laughs> and we saw this week the comments that he has made. It has been bizarre to see a sitting president. First of all, I have no idea why he's going over to Poland, why he's meeting with troops there. I mean, that in and of itself is concerning. 
concerning. But then on top of that, he first makes the comment where he tells U.S. troops that they're going to see Ukraine. And then all of a sudden the White House comes in and says, well, no, no, that's not really what he meant. And then he comes out and he says that Putin can't remain in power. And then the White House comes out again and says, no, that's really not what he meant. Well, my question is, what does he mean? Because right now he's making one statement after another. I mean, they let him leave the White House. They're letting him make these speeches and clearly they're being broadcast all around the world. But it is making Biden look absolutely ridiculous. And I know you broke it down in your monologue at the top of the show, but we don't necessarily have any great options when it comes to an immediate replacement for Biden if you're looking at Kamala Harris or at Nancy Pelosi. So it is an incredibly concerning time to not only be in the United States, but to see exactly where the United States is headed, especially as it keeps trying to play around with World War III, and it, it does not look like the Biden administration is backing down anytime soon on this one. Well, look, I said when uh, Donald Trump beat, uh, beat Hillary Clinton, I'm not happy that Donald Trump is the president of the United States, but I'm very happy that Hillary Clinton isn't. I've got to put it to you, it's a controversial point of view amongst many of my supporters. Uh, but I'm convinced of it, that it would have been better for the world if Trump had beaten Joe Biden. Yeah, I mean, we're in that spot right now where I don't know exactly where we would be if Donald Trump had beaten Joe Biden. However, given everything that the Biden administration has done, especially with ramping up, I mean, we just saw this last few weeks, Congress came together magically, and they passed a historic $13.6 billion in funding to Ukraine, nearly half of which goes to prop up Ukraine's military. And so, you know, if we had Trump in office, I'm curious to see how he would respond to it. But with Biden, it seems as if he's got something he's trying to prove here. And as if he genuinely thinks that he can push for an overthrow of Vladimir Putin. And he doesn't seem to see the part where in order to even go forward with trying to make that happen, that means World War III and that means the possibility of nuclear war. I mean, this is not Saddam Hussein in Iraq. This is not, you know, any of the leaders that the U.S. has just come in overthrown and then done whatever they wanted to with their country. And I think we're really seeing the writing on the wall right now, as you see the U.S. and its Western allies saying that they're going to come together and essentially sanction Russia out of the civilized world. And then you have countries like China, India, Saudi Arabia that are kind of taking a step back here and saying, well, no, no, not so fast. I don't think you realize just how much the global economy relies on Russia when it comes to natural resources. And yet another comment that Joe Biden made there, which arguably if Donald Trump would have said this, the media would have lost their minds as they should have in this case. Biden made a comment where he said that the world should get ready for a global food crisis. And for what? For Ukraine? For a country that the majority of Americans can't find on a map now, in addition to facing prices at 40-year highs all around our country, in addition to facing skyrocketing gas prices. Now we're supposed to be looking at facing a global food crisis because the Biden administration decides that it can't give up in its quest to make sure that Ukraine is propped up and has the leaders that it wants it to have. And also maybe that leads to World War III. I mean, it, we're getting into this point where nothing makes sense right now. No, it is uh, surreal. Uh, he was uh, very clear about it. The, there's going to be a global food crisis, and it's going to be real. Uh, he's not going to go short of food, of course, although the way he was eating that pizza in the uh, military mess, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure his teeth yeah. do much uh, chomping uh, these days, but none of the elite in America are going to suffer a global food crisis. It's the poor of your country, my country, and around the world. It's them that are going to face a global food crisis. It's them uh, that are going to pay the price of the skyrocketing inflation, including uh, fuel costs, but not, uh, not limited to fuel costs. Gas, 
uh, uh, petrol, uh, the price of generating electricity, uh, the cost of manufacturing because of Russia's huge contribution in raw materials to the manufacturing process. Even the neon, most of the neon in the world comes from Russia. So get used to seeing the neon lights going out in Las Vegas. All of this for a country that, as you say, nobody knew anything about it except thee and me and a few select others just a month or two ago. It just doesn't make any sense, as you put it. Yeah, yeah. And you see, it's been crazy to see, too, just the movement of people on social media that are there saying hashtag pray for Ukraine and that are condemning Russia. And yet these are people who have no idea about the 2014 coup. They have no idea what the Azov Battalion is or that the U.S. has been called out time and time again for funding far right neo-Nazi groups. They act as if this is a conflict that just started a few weeks ago go and that it is so clear cut and that there is no U.S. involvement to it. And it's been incredibly concerning to watch just how quickly so many people have jumped on board with that, because at the end of the day, when you're defending censorship, when you're calling for people to be completely deplatformed off of the Internet, you may be doing that because you don't agree with them or it makes no difference in your life, whether they're on Twitter, YouTube or not. But what you're doing is you're setting in motion and incredibly troubling precedent. And this is not going to end with just Russia and Ukraine. This is going to be something that is used again and again. And it really is the next forefront of propaganda that we're seeing rolling out here. And here in the United States, the two major parties are both magically on board with it. It's funny how that happens. Hands across the aisle. Rachel Blevins, a joy to see you back on our show again. Thank you very much indeed. Hope to see you again soon. Let's go straight to calls for the rest uh, uh, of... No, not the rest. I've got another guest. So let me go quickly then to Esther in Scotland. Go ahead, Esther. Good evening, sir. Good evening to you. Uh, right, I just want to be really quick. Um, I was away for a couple of days and I was sitting thinking and I thought, you know what, I don't want to be someone who just complains about what I see I don't like and complain, you know. I'm thinking, how, how, do, how do I be the change that I want to see? And I'm thinking, because if change is just an illusion, then I'm going to be a sucker to a system that I can do nothing about. And I don't know about you, but that sounds incredibly depressing to me, but I'm an optimist by nature. And I, I, I try to see the positive and, you know, without being cuckoo or, you know, falling into all these different cliches, but seriously, and I just, how, how does the average Joe go about making change? How do we, because people say, oh, vote, vote for the party, you know, we vote, but does my vote really count? If Labour and Conservative no, uh, are the if, same uh, as, you know, if, uh, two cheeks yeah, of the same exactly. as, you know, how... how if voting, as, uh, as uh, Ken Livingston... Uh, well, I can't give you any. If, if as Ken Livingston said, <laughs> if voting changed anything, uh, they, would, they would have abolished it. Uh, we don't know the result of elections, but we know who's going to lose. And who's going to lose is the working people. Uh, the poor, uh, the people that need a government on their side but never get one. They get Tweedledee or they get Tweedledum. They get the left cheek or the right cheek of the same ass. That's what we've got to change. We need complete change. We need complete change, not not a, a, a shift between the guy in the grey suit and the red tie and the guy in the blue suit with the blue tie. We need complete change yep. and that's what mm -hmm. I stand for that's what I have fought for uh, you can yep. uh, uh, check me out Esther if you haven't already uh, we've got plans we just need people to support them Esther thanks for the call Larry is in Switzerland let's go to Switzerland why wouldn't we go on Larry hello George nice to hear How from you? you good um are you sitting down? <laughs> I am, yes. <laughs> okay, because 
have you heard Bashar al Assad's Bashar al Assad's speech about Ukraine and World War Two? No, I didn't hear it. No. He gave a speech, and it was shocking, but it wasn't shocking to Russians. He was talking about. I live in Switzerland, and I'm not angry that the Swiss worked with the Nazis. I'm angry that the Swiss worked with the British and the Americans that worked with the Nazis. And they staged World War II to to, uh, Germany went through uh, Europe, and then everything stopped, and they went and attacked Russia. You could say it was the Soviets, but it was Russia. I heard a Russian politician that said Russia never thought that they were fighting Hitler. They always thought they were fighting the West, and I really believe it. Because living well, here, they're never going trying... to. Yeah, they're never going to allow that to happen again. They lost 26 million dead people in World War II. They are never going to allow uh, that Central European plane to be able to be the launch pad for an invasion of their country again. They can either secure that, Larry, by negotiation, or they can secure it by uh, conquest. Uh, But one way or another, that will be secure. Russia was invaded three times across that plane, first by Napoleon, then by the Kaiser, then by Hitler. There won't be a fourth time. They will never allow Ukraine to be a member of a hostile military alliance any more than we would allow our neighbors to be members of hostile military alliances and have armed camps in them and point missiles from them, including nuclear missiles. Anyone who believes that will believe anything. From Switzerland, we're going to the fjords. It's John in Norway. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I feel so sad for the older guard that, uh, you know, they they grew up around the Second World War and they feel very passionate about, you know, anti-Nazi. And now with all the propaganda, they, they are kind of fooled. They're supporting the side that they are completely against. And this is, you know, on behalf of BBC, NRK, Norway all these TV channels that they trust, you know, like my parents. You're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, I told you about that Netflix documentary, Einsatzgruppen, Hitler's Death Squads. It is the most profoundly affecting documentary I have ever seen in my whole life, which has not been a short one. It uh, doesn't just go into the uh, almost unbelievable bestiality of the Nazi regime itself, but the Nazis of the occupied countries, including your own, and if we had been conquered, the same kind of quislings would have arisen here. Don't think I'm uh, claiming British exceptionalism. If we had surrendered or we had been conquered, uh, we'd have had a quisling too. But the role played by Romanian fascists, Hungarian fascists, Ukrainian fascists, in the mass murder of millions upon millions upon millions of Jews, Russian prisoners of war, partisans, Poles, anyone that they considered to be a subhuman, the role played by these countries, they should be hanging their heads in shame until now, instead of arming and funding and propagandizing for the sons, the grandsons of those Nazi collaborators who massacred a hundred thousand Jews in Babi Yar outside Kiev. Who did it? It was Ukrainian Nazis that did it. The SAS stood around smoking while they watched the Ukrainian Nazis murder 150,000 Jews in a gorge on the outskirts 
of Kiev. Just think about that. John, last word to you. Yeah, I just want to uh, just uh, say something about, I, I think like the motivation for Europe now to be so uh, behind this is uh, after COVID with, you know, they, there is a big bill to be paid and and uh, and inflation is going up and what we see in europe now is that there is pressure on salaries right and what uh, what is actually happening is that the, the workers from poland from romania from bulgaria they are not coming to norway now they are not coming to france so the pressure on the salaries are going that's why they are so interested in getting all these uh refugees from Ukraine and giving them the best refugee benefits ever seen before. It's because the pressure on, on salaries are right now very high. That's my last John, thanks. A uh, very interesting call from Norway. Uh, let's get a German point of view. Julius is on the line from Germany. Go ahead, Julius. Welcome. Uh, hello, George. Can you hear me? Very clearly, Hello? thank you very much. Yes, very clearly. Yeah, George, fantastic. It's an, it's an honor to have you, uh, to speak to you right now. I'm a big fan. I first heard of you actually when you were speaking at the U.S. Congress, I think about more than a decade ago. That was, that was something uh, 2005, special. 2005, yeah. 15, yeah. 16 and years I, ago now. Be, believe it or not, that was not the high point. The high point for me was when I was working in Southampton. I live in Germany now. I was working in Southampton and I had a Lebanese friend and we were talking during that invasion of Israel into Lebanon. And then I, he goes like, oh, the entire UK media is not presented fairly. And I go like, you haven't seen George Galloway speak to Anna Bolting, have you? You should watch it, yeah. which he did. And I was that like, was a oh, good wow, one, yeah. that was amazing. That was, that, uh, was, that, may be, that may be my biggest internet uh, hit. My interview with Sky News in 2006. Exactly. You were like, they're getting a bloody good hiding. I was like, oh my God. Bloody good hiding was the words that were, yeah. in, <laughs> that were in my mind. I, I, anyway, I Julius, how does that. Ukraine, how does Ukraine look from a German point of view? Um, I think everybody's buying the propaganda, unfortunately. You put on ZTF, it's the same. You put on AIB, it's the same. It's almost Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine every time. But George, what really surprises me, I cannot for the life of me believe what the European leaders are doing. I really can't. Because what they're doing is they're just blanketly supporting the US idea. What's the point of this? Now, at the beginning of the year, my gas price went up by 50 euros. Think about it. That was even before the war, right? And if it's going to go higher, guess who's going to benefit from it? It's going to be the ones that they are described as far right, like the AFD in Germany or the National Rally in France. These two parties, which are supposed to be extreme, they have it correct on this. Would you believe it? Like if you go on the AFD youth website, they start talking about maybe we shouldn't be expanding to the east. What uh, Hans Dietrich Gelsner said, keine Osterweiterung. So they kind of have it correct. So if things become harder in Europe, what happens? These right wing, supposed right wing parties come in, they are all Euro skeptics. They are literally nuking the EU and they are not even seeing it. I mean, how is this happening? Nope. I don't understand it. I really can't. Well, uh, Ukraine is the main uh, loser uh, from this situation, but Europe is the second loser. There's no doubt at all about that. And amongst the losers in Europe that will lose the most, Germany is right up there. Uh, that much ought to have been clear. But the political class in the European countries, with the vague exception of Macron, and mainly because he's facing very serious electoral challenges now uh, in the upcoming presidential election, uh, all the rest have uh, drunk the Kool-Aid, Julius. It's unfortunate because there are people here in Germany who are saying maybe too much sanctions will not work because it's going to affect us in the process. And then I watched Joe Biden on TV talking about, you know, there's going to be huge food shortages because the sanctions that we're imposing on Russia has an effect on us. Why are you punishing yourself just to hurt Russia? How does that make any political sense? Let well, that's right, and uh, and people will people will conclude that. Uh, I don't care how stupid a lot of people are; they know, uh, even if they've been fooled, 
they can do nothing mm-hmm. about Putin, but they can do something about their own governments, and I believe that they will. Julius, thanks for that call from Germany. Kevin is in England, in Suffolk. Let's hear from Kevin. Go ahead, Kevin. Hello, mate. Um, Welcome. We're all dissidents now. Um, that's what I've got to say. <laughs> yeah. um, right, OK. I um, am very ambivalent about Putin. I, I don't support his government. I think he could have done a lot of positive things over the last 20 years that he hasn't done. But um, I think he was an obstacle to <clears throat> whatever project is going on at the moment in the US Democrat Party, which I think is the greatest threat to uh, world order. It's the is. war party. Uh, it's the war party. It always has been. Well, it just, I, I don't even think, I, I don't even think it's about that. I think it is about accumulating wealth and power for various big families. And I, you know, it, I mean, it's just beyond, I, I, I just, you know, the scale of it is frightening. Um, but what I was going to say is, I think uh, Russia's been suckered into this. I think this was, I think they were fed false intel. I think they weren't ready for the kind of war that uh, has developed. And I think, you know, I, I, I don't take any pleasure in it, but I mean, they seem to be taking a kick in, you know, that they've, they've lost a lot. No, uh, yeah, no, they haven't. Uh, that's just fake news, Kevin. Uh, and uh, if they'd been taking a kicking, you would have seen the footage of their bodies. You have not seen the footage of their bodies. You've not seen hardly any war footage at all. It's fake news, as when this conflict is over, will be clear to everyone. But I appreciate your call, and I appreciate the spirit in which you uh, made it. Uh, I've got to take a quick break with this question. In this week, in 1961, the treason trial of Nelson Mandela ended. How long did the trial last? A, four and a half years. B, eight weeks. C, six months. That's a hard one. Answer right after this. The mother of all talk shows was created because early lunacy detection can save lives. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, some IQs declined by 90%. Now, doctors are diagnosing later stage lunacy, which could have been detected sooner. Don't wait. Share the mother of all talk shows with a loved one and speak to George Galloway about common sense today. It takes all of us to overcome idiots. Call the teacher today and get an education. Comrades, tired of being trapped in mainstream media? Join the revolution with mother of all talk shows has been instrumental in making brain and heart of people stronger like kettlebell for mind. Don't be brainwashed, CC, an open mind to new way of thinking. If you don't know how, George will teach you. If you won't learn, he will make you. <laughs> Speak to Comrade Galloway if you think you're hard enough on the mother of all talk shows. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland, and I love the Scottish food. It's great food. I said to Melania, you know, haggis. Look at that. What's more than more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? Yo, Mikey, what's happening? Joey! The usual? Sure. You looking fresh, man. You get a new haircut? Nah, brother. I just got that... 
you know, scholarship from the College of Knowledge. Oh, you got into the University of the Airwaves? Sure did, brother. I got knowledge coming out of my ears. GG, man. He knows what's up. I knew there was something new about you. Yo, reckon you take me? Everyone is welcome, brother. Even from Jersey. <laughs> The Giant Labour Party sailing clearance is now on. Hurry now, as we've got zero interest in our party. It's literally the lowest it's ever been. Give up on the common man and save today. That's right, we're getting rid of all of the Corbinites. Literally every single one. Being a Blairite has never been more in style. Only available at what should be the UK's biggest political party. The new, new Labour Party. We're doing this again. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, our record poll is 10,200 votes. You've got 10 minutes or so still to vote if you haven't. And it now stands at 9,976. So, roughly 225 short of a record. Has Joe Biden lost his mind over Putin regime change? It's overwhelming so far. 87% say yes on uh, Twitter. 93% say yes on YouTube, which hasn't changed all night. Uh, 98% on Telegram. Uh, it is extraordinary. Now, 198 people have called. That is also a record. Uh, the phone lines have been rammed. Thanks for calling. I'm sorry if we didn't get to answer your call. Now, Andy Mock is the Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, where he focuses on technology and its impact on great power relations Andy, Mark, very welcome to the mother of all talk shows. Thanks for joining us at this hour. I'm uh, most grateful. Thank you. Now, um, I know that uh, technology is your forte, but I also know that you take a, a close interest in the issue of currency. I've been arguing uh, that the main weapon uh, in the armory of U.S. hegemony is actually the dollar rather than the cruise missile, rather than the military hardware, uh, which they're not actually all that good at anyway. They don't like to hear this, but they haven't won a war since 1945, and it wasn't even them that won that. Uh, so how have they remained the global hegemon all this time? The answer surely lies in Bretton Woods, and it lies in... The uh, Saudi oil uh, deal with them, uh, which led to Saudi Arabia pricing its oil in uh, dollars. If it begins to change that paradigm, U.S. power potentially falls away like leaves in the autumn. Yes. No, George, you're right. I mean, you know, everything we see from... Uh, so-called American soft power uh, out of Hollywood perpetuates this myth that, you know, what makes the U.S. great uh, is its military machine. And there's no doubt that it's enormous, um, you know, something like $750 billion U.S. billion a year uh, is spent on defense. You know, that's the uh, U.S. military budget. Um, and there are, there's a lot of impressive technology. It's a large army, of course, but you're absolutely correct. The real power and the real foundation of American hegemony is the U.S. dollar. And to put this in, you know, relatively straightforward terms, and of course we can get into uh, some of the, the economics of it, um, but put it this way. Uh, money used to be worth something. So you think about gold. People would use gold for money, and it, that's because it was hard to find. It was valuable. And what happened, think about it this way. If you or I, instead of having to give something valuable like gold for things that we wanted, 
uh, we could go to the pub, to the bar, have a beer. And instead of giving real money, we could write a piece of paper that says, I owe you some money. If I wanted to go buy a car, I could do the same thing. If I wanted to buy a house, I could do the same thing. Now, wouldn't that be a wonderful world? And in fact, that is what the U.S. has been doing uh, since the 70s uh, when they delinked uh, the U.S. dollar from gold, meaning it used to be that you – a U.S. dollar stood for a certain amount of gold that you could exchange for gold, for something of real worth. And today, uh, or actually since the 70s, uh, it's become what's called fiat money, which means that there's it's nothing more than just a piece of paper. But now you've got a problem. If I wrote an IOU and I went to the bar, the bartender would probably laugh at me. So, But what happens? The U.S. was able to say to also at the same time to Saudi Arabia, because everyone in the world needs oil, and Saudi Arabia then and still is uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, oil producers in the world, say, look, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, we would sure like it if you would only take our IOUs for oil. And, of course, oil is a very real and valuable product that everyone around the world needs. So in exchange for providing a military guarantee, uh, Saudi Arabia said yes. And, of course, now that creates an enormous demand for these IOUs. So if you or I were able to do that, we would have a pretty good thing going there. And, in fact, that is what has been happening. Now, the problem with this, though, is that once you get addicted to doing something like this, you tend to write more and more IOUs for more and more stuff. And that's one way we could understand uh, inflation, which, of course, is uh, skyrocketing today, not just because of the unfortunate events in Ukraine and the uh, the food and energy crises that it's causing, but just in general. Uh, you know, it's very hard for anybody uh, to restrain uh, their desire for things, but it's even harder where you have to uh, try to persuade people to support you in a two-party system, and the best way to do that is just promise to give them more stuff, and so you then have more and more of these IOUs. So, George, you're absolutely correct. That is, uh, I think that uh, this is really the root and the foundation of American power, American hegemony. And we're in a very interesting time now in that uh, because of the unfortunate events in Ukraine, uh, the U.S. has launched not only uh, a military war and a propaganda war, but also an economic war against Russia. And the economic war uh, is the one that I think – uh, is more important and doesn't get uh, nearly as much attention. So I'm really glad that we have the opportunity to talk about this today. Uh, but in this economic war, what the uh, U.S. has done is it's uh, seized Russian assets, including the assets of the central bank. Now, here's the big problem with these U.S. IOUs, then, is the U.S. at the same time is saying, well, you can also use these IOUs because you can trust us that we will be fair-minded, uh, essentially referees of the financial system. And, you know, the U.S., we, we know that follow the, the, the geopolitical scene, uh, is, can be very, very difficult to deal with at the country level because every four years there's a presidential election. And there can be a 180-degree pivot in direction. So, you know, if you're a country, you're a Germany, you're, you know, another country, a U.K. even, um, and the U.S. says one thing, and then four years later says, uh, well, sorry, we've changed our mind. We want to go in another direction. You know, that can be very, very challenging. But now um, I think what the world has seen is not only does it have to deal with this, but uh, the – financial system, the U.S. dollar, which most of the world relies on, has been shown to be fundamentally unreliable because now uh, I could say if I was issuing all these IOUs, oh, you know what, I, because I don't like you, your IOUs are now worthless. Um, so this is, I think, really going to create a problem in the long term for the U.S. I hope I didn't go on too long about that, <laughs> but you uh, No, you, you didn't. It was uh, a positively brilliant answer. And what I was just thinking, if American imperialism is a paper tiger, we didn't know it was an IOU paper tiger.
Tiger. I think the uh, the metaphor is brilliant. But they've run out of road on it because China is increasingly capable uh, of not only eating its lunch, but actually taking over the IOU business. It is increasingly capable of being a reserve currency itself, isn't it? <laughs> Well, we really have to see, George. I mean, clearly, and again, if we go back just to the basics, um, why would anyone want U.S. dollars or Chinese yuan? And at the end of the day, we really don't care about these pieces of paper. And in fact, today, they're really not pieces of paper. They're just bits in the, the digital world. And, you know, we transfer uh, a number from one account to another account. But anyway, it's it's useful to think about it as, as these pieces of paper. So why do we even want these pieces of paper? It's because we can exchange them for stuff we actually want. It could be a cup of coffee. It could be a nice dinner. It could be, you know, a, tr a vacation. Um, and ultimately what it comes down to is who's producing the stuff that people want. So we've known for decades that China is known as the workshop of the world. But increasingly, uh, China's making not just low-end things or, you know, relatively low-value-add things like shoes, clothing, toys, but increasingly moving up to, say, 5G equipment, you know, the world's most advanced smartphones. Companies like Huawei are doing this. Um, that So what you need, though, is that the people in China don't want dollars because people in China spend yuan. So at the end of the day, um, whoever's making the most valuable stuff, sooner or later, their currency becomes the most sought after. Now, again, but if you have commandeered the choke points of the global financial system, so not just uh, enforcing the use of the dollar for things like oil, but you also control the electronic network that allows banks and through banks, everyone else around the world, to move money around the world. Uh, now, you know, you've got something. So even if uh, you're not producing as many things as other people want, uh, and there may be a country that's producing more of them, uh, this is, again, the stranglehold and the, uh, I think, the foundation of American hegemony. And you're right that we're seeing this challenge today, and it's not just by China. Uh, so I should say that, uh, you know, as you know, and I'm sure many people in the audience know, that um, India has recently came out and said, uh, we're going to work with Russia uh, and set up a rupee-ruble payment system that avoids the dollar, uh, using the dollar and uh, going through SWIFT. So SWIFT is the, the, the interbank network uh, that, even though it's headquartered in Brussels, is actually really controlled by the U.S., so um, so we're seeing some cracks here, and I think that there's been enormous uh, resentment around the world uh, at dollar hegemony. And the sometimes, uh, you know, what feels to many people like the capricious use and abuse of the system, but this might be the uh, final uh, element that really uh, undermines the system. Not to say the dollar will go away, again, the U.S., uh, is the largest economy in the world in nominal terms, but it's actually only the second largest in purchasing power parity terms. Um, so it's not that the dollar is going away, but I think that the U.S.'s ability to enforce and punish uh, countries, companies, people around the world may be severely weakened. Um, and as I, you know, write in, a, I wrote in a recent piece. Um, that the U.S.'s uh, launching of these three wars against uh, Russia was intended to solve the problem, but it might have created an even worse problem uh, for itself. And, you know, as, as then-President Obama allegedly said about Joe Biden, never underestimate Joe's ability to F things up, that here, you know, the intended cure for a problem might be far worse uh, than what they're trying to solve. Or, as a famous Chinaman put it, sometimes they struggle to lift a huge stone only to drop it on their own feet. 
Andy Mock, you are a star. We'll have you back on the show, if you will, as soon as possible. Thanks for joining us. The poll is a record. 11,005 people have voted, and it's really bad news, Joe. It's not just a record poll. It's a record defeat for you. 87%, 92%, and 98%. Let's go to uh, as many callers as we can. Andre in Virginia. Go ahead, Andre. Hey, George, real quick. Uh, good evening to you. Second time I Good evening. You. I just got a question to ask you, man. What do you think about that um, prank call interview with your um, British... Um, <laughs> Secretary. That's all I wanted. It was know. very funny. It was very, it was very funny. Uh, our defense, defense secretaries are not what they used to be. Uh, this fellow would scarcely get the job of polishing the regimental brass in the officer's mess. And if you've had ever done to do with the military, you'll know the kind of dullard that gets that job. So think now. Officer's mess, the dumbest officer is given a chamois and told to polish the regimental brass. That's Ben Wallace. He is laughably our defense secretary. He's sitting in a car in Poland and a joker, a TV and radio DJ in Moscow gets through to him on his car phone in the embassy car in Poland and start saying to him and encouraging him to say the most damaging and ultimately the most ludicrous things. And he does. He talks and talks and talks. So puffed up with importance is he that the Ukrainian prime minister who's really a DJ in Moscow has called him on his car phone that he makes a complete fool of himself. Andre, he's a liability. In any sane government, he would already have been sacked, not for doing the wrong thing politically, just for being stupid. And he'd be sent back to the mess to polish the regimental silver. Maureen in Texas. Go ahead, Maureen. Yes, hello, George. I wanted Hi. to comment on... Yes, hi. On the coverage in the news for most Americans, and especially in this part of of the U.S. and Central Texas, which tends to be conservative and support the military regardless of political party affiliation or support. I think most what I'm seeing in the papers and on the news is nothing but one-sided about Russia and Putin are evil, nothing about how we got here. Um, even today in the in the local paper, there's an editorial saying, as Americans struggle about with higher energy prices, we need to assign blame to where it's due, Vladimir Putin and nobody else. But that, um, does that cut it, Maureen? Because you can't do anything about that, even if that was true, which it isn't. Right. I mean, what, um, are, peop are, what are, are people going to just collapse under an economic burden that they cannot bear, and as they go under, a curse uh, Putin, or are they more likely, as the polls seem to suggest they're doing, say, well, whatever happened, it happened on your watch, Joe, and we're going to punish you for it. Oh, yes, I, I predict an extreme Republican wave come the midterms, for sure. You see, you Not mentioned the word conservative, Maureen. You, want, you mentioned the word conservative. The reason why uh, America's not as bad, however bad you think it is, not as bad as Britain and other European countries right now, is because there's a substantial section of America actually believes that Biden's presidency is illegitimate, that he's trying to use war and the potential lives of American soldiers to look over here, as the professor said earlier, rather than over there at the mess that I, the president, have made. There's a lot of people like that in America who are conservative, might even be right-wing, 
They might be Republican. They might be Trumpers. But they ain't going to follow Joe Biden over the cliff. That's my take. Last word to you, Maureen. And yes, and I I tend to lean liberal or progressive. I don't like to use labels um, but on most issues, but I saw from the primaries how they were propping up Joe Biden and yeah. yeah so and no, they I, destroyed I'm not uh, they destroyed me. Bernie. They destroyed Bernie yes. Sanders because he he couldn't yes. be trusted by the military industrial complex. He couldn't be trusted by Wall right. Street. He couldn't be trusted by the big donors. That's why they had to strap Joe Biden to his horse. <laughs> Otherwise, he'd have fallen off it. Maureen, thank you for a lovely exactly. call. Sorry we don't have more time. Uh, Mohammed is in London. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Mohammed. Um, evening, George. Thank you for evening. allowing me to speak on your oh. show. Um, okay. I, I don't know why more people haven't made more of this, but Eric Prince was sort of swanning around in Ukraine in 2020 trying to invest $10 billion to make a private weapons plant and private army in Ukraine. Now, Eric, Eric Prince is the uh, is director of what was Blackwater. Uh, Blackwater, yeah. A private, a private CIA-run company. And uh, if you drop $10 billion in Ukraine, you own Ukraine. So I would imagine... Exactly. That, you know, at that time, at that time, $10 billion would have bought you the whole country. Well, beyond that, I don't see why European countries don't see... Or well, the people don't see the game of America. I mean, America's just secured um, a long-term oil contract and gas contract with, with Germany and the EU, actually. And now we're going to be the whipping boys who are funding the U.S. So why, why would the U.S. want to have any other foreign policy right now in Ukraine other than the destruction of Ukraine to create fear in Europe so they can, you know, suck us dry with overinflated gas prices? which we now are, are having ourselves committed to. Well, I think that's the call of the night, Mohammed. Uh, you have hit the nail on the head. Um, the only question is, to whom shall we attribute the blame for this? I blame us. Uh, we are the fools in this picture. Uh, in order to pay inflated prices for American liquid gas, we have destroyed the European energy sector. We're going to have inferior product, less easy supply, and vastly increased prices for energy for the rest of our lives, probably. All to boost the profits of the United States. All to please Joe Biden, of all people. Now, the way you described it, Eric Prince, Blackwater, private armies, private bio labs, bio warfare, and all the rest, only a fool would fall for that. But we have fallen for it, Mohammed. What kind of fools are we? I must tell you, I thought that after what happened in Iraq in 2003, that we wouldn't get fooled again. But we have, haven't we? Well, we're the kinds of fools that will have to mull this over over some chlorinated chicken from the U.S. as well, I'm sure. Yeah. It is almost incredible when the truth is out there, as I pointed out earlier. It's not that you have to listen to CNN or Sky News. It's not that you have to believe what you hear there. You can go online. You can find the other point of view, but not enough people are doing so. Not enough people are doing so. Mohammed in London, thanks for that final call of the show, uh, which was an exceedingly uh, good one. I'll be back here next Sunday at 7 p.m. London time with the mother of all talk shows. Uh, but I'll be on YouTube, on my YouTube channel at 10 p.m. on Wednesday. I'll still be able to take your messages, maybe even your calls. We're working hard to put together the wherewithal, uh, technically, to allow calls. But we'll certainly be able to read out your messages and deal with them. So you'll see me next on YouTube 
at 10 p.m. on Wednesday. And you'll see the full singing, dancing, mother of all talk shows on Sunday at 7 p.m. Until then, it's been marvelous. Thanks for being with me.